Like to go ahead and call this meeting to order, Mrs. Perry. Dr. McBride. Here. Mr. Perez. Here. Dr. Gase. Here. Mr. Kisabeth. Here. Mr. Williams. Here. Next up, we will adopt the agenda. Mrs. Perry, are there any addendums? We have an additional presentation in item number three, and that will be by Aaron Montz from Tiff and Seneca Economic Partnership. Wonderful. So I accept a, a motion to accept the agenda or adopt the agenda with the amendment. So moved. Second. Mrs. Perry. Mr. Perez. Yes. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. And that will bring us to our presentations and we'll begin with Mr. Aaron Mons, the president and CEO of TSIP. There we go. I think we got it. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, school board members. Um, I'm just before you this evening to talk very quickly about the uh, the pending CRA, uh, which is Community Reinvestment Area application that is before uh, you and Tiffin City Council. Um, we, as I made the presentation to Tiffin City Council last week, we have a uh, new na national national retailer that is uh, seeking to come to Tiffin, uh, that being Hobby Lobby. Um, they are coming here contingent on the approval of a, of a CRA agreement with Tiffin City Schools and Tiffin City Council. Um, essentially, what that would do to make, it, make the presentation very brief, they are in an existing CRA area already. Uh, however, that CRA area is what is called a post-94, meaning any of them after 1994. They're required to get uh, school board approval and city council approval. Uh, they are required to obtain Tiffin City School approval if the ask is great is 50 percent or greater on a property tax exemption uh, over a period of time. So they can ask for anywhere from zero to 100 percent for anywhere from one year to 15 years. Uh, the ask from Hobby Lobby to come here to Tiffin is five years for 50 percent. Um, in my personal opinion, ones that I've worked on in the past. Uh, while I was mayor, uh, this is very reasonable. We have had businesses come in the past asking for a full 100% for 12 or 15 years. Uh, we've had others ask for 75%. I think if anything, it says it says something about the folks at the Tiffin Mall and Hobby Lobby that they have asked for 50%, knowing they could have asked for 49% and not come to anyone for any kind of approval. They're here wanting to play ball to get this approved. Uh, if granted, uh, they plan to open a store at the Tiffin Mall uh, sometime in hopefully Q3 of next year, which means they'll be here for the retail season for Christmas. Uh, they also plan to employ 60 full-time employees uh, and 20 additional part-timers. The total investment is somewhere in the neighborhood of $4 million, including an all-new interior and exterior renovation, new roof, uh, as well as parking lot improvements. Uh, I did uh, share with the superintendent a schedule. I believe the, uh, r the rest of you have that. Uh, not asking you to vote tonight. I know um, I have called some of you and talked with you a little about this, but I know this is the first time that many are hearing it. Uh, the, the ask would be that it's approved at the meeting on the 19th um, by the school board. So then that would allow Tiffin City Council to weigh in and vote at their, meet, their first meeting in 2023 on January the 3rd. Uh, in doing so, this gives the Tiffin Mall and Hobby Lobby what they view as, as a reasonable time period, knowing how long it takes in this day to secure construction team as well as materials for them to meet their scheduled opening date next year sometime late Q3 before the Christmas season begins. Um, I am happy to answer any questions if there are any this evening. I guess the one thing I should say, I didn't say, but I know most of you have been around. This is for new, this is an abatement on new taxes. Uh, the Tiffin City Schools, the City of Tiffin, Vanguard Sentinel, everyone who receives property taxes will still receive every dime that they receive today. For the next five years then, they will, you all will receive 50% still of the new value. You just will not receive 100% of the new property tax value until year six. From that point forward, you receive all of this. So we're asking you to, to essentially give up 50% of the new tax value for the next five years, after which point it will go to receiving the full 100% of the newly created tax value. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. 
Uh, no, he answered it. Oh, Mr. Moss, uh, do you have an estimate of the the actual revenue that that would bring? Unfortunately, no, because it's all going to be left up to whatever the county auditor assesses once all of the improvements have been made. We are talking thousands. We're not talking hundreds of thousands or millions. We're talking in the thousands. But this exemption at the same time is what is necessary to keep the rent at a value that Hobby Lobby is comfortable with paying and signing the long-term lease at the mall. They're going to knock off the lease price on a monthly basis uh, from the CRA dollars that they'll be saving. Very simple. This isn't a question, Mr. Mons, but a, a comment. We're going to get 50% of new money if we so approve. If we don't approve and Hobby Lobby says, see you later, we're not coming, we not only lose a 50% or 50 increase, but the whole town loses a retailer. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for the record, I will uh, say that... Um, I've been pretty vocal about uh, my displeasure in the past of finding out uh, after the fact that we are the last ones to know about money that we will have to give up and um, not being uh, noted, notified early on. And uh, so I got to give Mr. Mons credit that uh, we actually were informed about this before the public knew. So I, I think that was a uh, thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you. I echo what Dr. Gay said. I think it was really, I, I have to thank you for reaching out. Now we haven't as a board been able to discuss this and we'll probably do it at our meeting next, if we put it on the agenda, but I think historically we were put in the spot of vote on it, you know, without any advance notice. And it would have been public that evening because it was at the city council meeting that it was announced. And so historically, you know, I, I think it's, I'm on record, I'm opposed to these because what it does is it takes our, makes us basically the financial arm for the state when if they really want to develop, they could put the tax money that they have out for this. However, in this instance, I think this was, it was nice to see that they came out with the 50% five years. It wasn't the 100% maximum that we've been hit with repeatedly and it wouldn't, and it will bring in income tax. It won't help us in that regard, but I think it helps out the city and the county. And anything that helps develop that mall, I think, is better for all of our students and our families as well. So, well, thank you, though. Thank you. And just to echo what this board has said, thank you for the collaboration and for working with us on this. Um, we're excited for what this could potentially bring to our students and our families and, and the community. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Mons? I do feel that the 50% shows good faith by them. And uh, that's certainly appreciated by the school system. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mons. Thank you all. As promised, we're gonna try to move somewhat quickly through this. Um, this presentation will be made available online starting sometime tomorrow. I believe in its current iteration, we have 130 slides. Does that sound about right? I'm looking at Mrs. Spar. They're pretty close. A little less, maybe 129. Um, so we are not going to read every slide today. Uh, for people that are in attendance or, or paying attention, uh, I, I, I think all of us would like to see our beds at some point in time tonight. Uh, but we are going to give a, a bit of a state of the district. This is not necessarily where we're going, but kind of where we are and a little bit of where we've been historically, because I think that's important for us to look at. Uh, I would like to thank all of the administration, all the leadership team that is here today, um, and you will be hearing from them as they present the sections that they created. Uh, and I appreciate all the work that they did. Uh, it's not common for a superintendent to always have to go to the leadership team and go, okay, you all have a homework project, uh, but they all did it. Um, and as far as I know, they didn't complain about it. So I, maybe they did behind my back, uh, but they, they all did it. And, they, and I think you're going to see they, they put a lot of work into this. Um, if we move to the next slide, please. And click. So 
Luckily, I have some of this memorized. So the best data never answers any questions. It only gives us more questions to ask. It would, it would be foolish of us to try to present everything in one fell time. Uh, the Board of Education, just so people that are watching online or here present, uh, they have been sent a copy of this, uh, of a draft of this in advance. So they've seen some of this, which is why I can skip through some of this. Uh, we're going to try to talk about the most salient points. Next. Uh, an important part, uh, one of the things that I heard when I was hired here is people wanting to talk about transparency and, and honesty about things. Almost all of this data that you are going to see is, is off of the Ohio Department of Education website. It's off the state auditor site. It, it, is, it is publicly sourced data. So there's only a little bit of this data that we had to compile ourselves, and it's anecdotal. Most of this is data that anybody could get access to. And I just wanted to make sure certain I highlighted that because I think that's important as we talk about transparency and honesty. And next. And in January, um, this is kind of where we are, where we've been. And in January, the, the plan at this stage would be to do a presentation to talk about how we should move our district forward. So that's going to be kind of the sequence of events today. And with no further ado, uh, I'm going to have a seat until the very, very end. And they are going to come up one at a time to do their presentation. And we will start off with the ever sparkly Mrs. Tewitt. Oh yeah, sorry. I forgot. I forgot I had one more. Next one. This is our state report card. You're right. Uh, this is our state report card. Uh, I am not a fan of the state report card. I will go on record saying I'm not a fan of the state report card. However, as much as it's not a great system for our district, I believe it's the same for every district. So it is, it is consistently unfair, uh, for lack of a better phrase. Um, I think you will see as a theme for today, you are going to see there are a lot of districts that would probably like to be us. Um, we are better than average, but in the conversations that I've had with board members, uh, community leaders, the leadership team, the teachers association, uh, various community leaders, I think we will find when we get done with this data, we are not where we think we should be yet. Um, we are not bad. I don't want anybody looking at this presentation wanting to jump off a bridge. We're good. Uh, we're, we're okay. Um, but we have a lot of room for growth. Uh, we have a lot of room for growth. So that is our state report card uh, as it presents right now. And now I will turn it over to Mrs. Tewitt. Thank you for allowing us to present to you this evening. Um, so our first slide, there are students that we are required to monitor and watch over and they are entitled or they are titled vulnerable youth. Um, Jerry will talk about one of those, uh, the ones that are in his category or the category students that he takes care of. The others are adjudicated, disadvantaged, foster, homeless, English language learners and military connected as well as unaccompanied. We provide many resources to these kiddos. Keep clicking. Um, one of the most valuable of these services are for mental health and well-being. And Jill Miller will present some of that information in just a few moments. As we approach, you're seeing the, the different percentages in front of you. We will get to a slide for open enrollment. And those are some numbers that have increased over the past few years. We currently have 170 students who come to us from other districts. And then we have 299 students who choose to go to another school system outside of our district. That's a loss of 129 students overall. As uh, far as mental health goes, every year our middle school and high school students take the OES survey, which stands for the Ohio Healthy Youth Environments. And this year, approximately 25%, that's one in four of our students, reported having four or more ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, which is above the county average. If you go to the pay it for it slide, This slide shows the needs that we are seeing in our families and students, with many families uh, counting on this service on a monthly and sometimes even on a weekly basis. 
At the middle and high school, we also present the Signs of Suicide program. You can see from this year's statistics on questions regarding ever attempted or seriously thought about suicide in the last four weeks that we have a real need for mental health supports. In response to all of this and more, we have a comprehensive tiered approach to mental health services. So our first approach is tier one, and this involves all our school counselors who are available for every student. Tier two includes district social workers who works with the needs that extend past the resources um, of tier one. This includes more focused individual and group counseling sessions for students with more intensive needs, coordination with community resources to help meet the needs of our students and families, and focus programming and professional development for our district. Tier three includes our mental health specialists who work directly and most intensively with our families and students. This may include diagnosing students or referring them to other agencies. Collectively, the three biggest challenges we see with our students that our students are struggling with include anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideations, which have only been exasperated in the last three years with the global pandemic. All right, so we are looking at early literacy, and this is our KRA, or the Kindergarten Readiness Assessment Revised Edition, that R just means it's shortened. So it's a shorter assessment. Um, students in starting prior to kindergarten are assessed in math, language and literacy, physical well-being and motor development, as well as social foundations. Um, and then they are giving an overall score of whether they're emerging, approaching, or demonstrating. Um, and we had a high of 53.5% in 2018. Um, and then we've evened out at 47% after that um, minus the 2021 year, which would have been right after COVID. So um, this is how we compare with other school districts um, that are similar to ours. Um, in 2022, we had a high of, we were had the ninth highest out of 21 districts for demonstrating readiness for kindergarten. And in 2020, we had a low of 19 out of, we were in the ninth, we were 19th out of 21. Um, our early literacy score for this past year was a three stars, was three stars out of five stars. Um, there are three measures to this particular score. Um, the first part of the measure is moving students from off track to on track. We determine off track um, based on our students' star scores, um, which is an online computer assessment. Um, and if they are below the 25th percentile, they are deemed to be um, off track. And then they also, all of those students are required to be on a reading improvement monitoring plan. So they have to be, we have to create a plan, have interventions for them um, so that we can move them ultimately from off track to on track. And so if you can see that 36.3% for this past year was we started out the year with 223 students off track and we moved 81 students to on track, and that's how they calculate that percentage. The second part of this measure is the um, what our score is on the third grade proficiency test, so that that, that third grade uh, results get calculated into that. And then the third part, the third part of this assess the score is um, the number of students that met the requirements to be promoted to fourth grade, and they are you can meet that in several different ways. One of the ways is obviously being proficient on the Ohio State test. The other part of that is being proficient on an alternative assessment, and we receive we have 100% on that. So starting in 2022. That's where we started using those three component pieces. And they use a percentage method of this. So they used 40% um, of the proficiency rate of our third graders, plus the 35% of the promotion to fourth grade um, score, plus 25% of improvement from that off track to on track in order to get our overall three star rating, which was 70.5. Now, um, prior to that, they just used the movement of off track to on track. 
So it was a, lot, a little bit of a simpler method um, to calculate. And you can see what our previous scores were for that. And um, then in comparison from similar districts, um, we had a high in 2020 where we ranked six out of 21 on that K-3 literacy piece. Um, in 2018, we had a low of, we were 19th out of 21. And last year we were ninth out of 21 similar districts. And this is just what our typical elementary K through five school days. Um, and you can see our um, class averages by grades as well. Good evening. Um, what I would like to explain to you is the achievement component, which is uh, measured with the performance index. Performance index is a measure where what they do is they determine calculations based on every student and their performance level. So you can see that it's weighted heavier if students are scoring in the, the advanced plus range. You're probably wondering why students might be untested. Um, sometimes students are left untested because there may be a refusal. It could be that a student was ill during the testing window. Um, those are some of the main reasons for a student being untested. So when you take all those calculations into account, our points this year, what we received was an 81.9%. Um, when we look at the performance index in comparison to the SBC, you'll notice that Tiffin City Schools is fifth out of sixth. Um, when we look at our local districts, um, we are sixth out of seventh place. And then if you look at similar districts, Similar districts as determined by the Ohio Department of Education, they take into account a variety of data from our report cards. And what they do is they determine districts that are most similar to ours. Um, and then you could see the list of districts. They give you 20 districts that they um, conclude are similar to our district. So if we look at our performance index, we are 16th out of 21. If you look at gap closing, we are 11th out of 21, but there is a sparkle there of hope. We have our prepared for success. We are third out of 21. Prepared for success, that indicator is measured by um, how we're preparing our students for the future. Um, and that also includes support from Sentinel and Vanguard um, as we have students who are engaging in um, programs that would include um, getting their industry credential. It also takes into account honors diplomas, ACT scores, AP scores, CCP scores, um, a variety of different scores go into that measure. Statewide comparison, um, you'll notice that in 2017, it was 84.2. Um, this last year, it was 79.3. There is no data for 2019, 2020 because we did not test that year because of COVID. Um, the other thing that I did want to point out in regards to the state data is that uh, we are 208th out of 620 schools, I believe. When we look at our performance index by our buildings, you could see that Kraut is 75.3, Noble 84.7, Tiffin Middle School 73.3, and Columbian is 76.6. .6. Please note Washington and Lincoln do not have PI scores. Professional development. This is a very important component when it comes to our district. We have a lot of different initiatives um, and our staff, we have wonderful staff, but there's always something ever changing. So we just kind of wanted to point out that there are certain requirements by the Ohio Department of Education, which includes gifted education. I'm not gonna go through that because Mrs. Zerm will discuss it. Uh, PBIS, positive behavioral intervention supports. Um, New is, of course, dyslexia training, um, specific to K through three, and then moving on to K through 12. Guidelines for successful professional learning systems. The Ohio Department of Education, of course, has some uh, rules and regulations for us to consider as we're developing our professional development. 
What I tried to do is I tried to lay out over the course of the various years some of the um, highlights of the professional development that we've had. Um, you'll notice that we started in 1718 with curriculum mapping. That's when the board had allowed me to work with our individual teams. Um, it was a great luxury in that I was able to get to know our teams and they really dug in and, and worked very, very hard. Um, Trauma-informed care, you're gonna notice that that pretty much carries over into almost every single year. Um, it is a reality in life now that things have changed greatly and our students' needs continue to rise. Um, We've also tried to address making sure we look at high yield strategies, which includes meaningful feedback. Um, social emotional learning, trauma informed care, like I said before. And then we're also trying to make sure that we look at and we address implicit bias. Um, how, how does our background change our perception of things? And then how can we work to make sure that every student has opportunities and is successful? Uh, OTES, which is the Ohio Teacher Evaluation System, uh, special education law, those are always important things to take a look at. Um, this last week, we were able to get together with our staff. What a blessing you gave us. Uh, we were able to focus in on special education, response to intervention, phonics first for our K through three, multi-tiered support systems, and crisis prevention intervention training, along with our guidance and social work department did an outstanding job of addressing the mental health needs of our staff um, and trying to help them understand how their mental health is also very important as they assist our students. Additional requirements, the district has uh, public school works that what that does is it sends out modules for our staff that they have to complete. A lot of times it addresses child abuse and rec uh, recognition and prevention, and there are different factors in there related to first aid, CPR, and other things. OTES and OPEZ, like I had mentioned earlier, is another continued area of uh, required professional development. Next up. Uh, good evening. I get to have the honor of speaking about reading achievement. As you know, some of our developments this year in regards to elementary, um, K through five, will be uh, directly talking about reading achievement to hopefully change these um, scores and what we have currently. So remember, I'm going to talk about two things tonight, achievement and progress or growth. And those are two different things in regards to the state report card. So reading achievement is truly how the students score. And we've seen some slides already about advanced plus, advanced, uh, proficient, um, limited and those sort of things. So when we talk about reading achievement, we received a 76.4, which was three stars, which puts us right in the middle of the of the five star rating there and in reading this year. Now, I like little graphs and I appreciate Mr. Murphy helping me with these. Um, you can see from our from our um, chart to the left, I think is a really nice thing where you can kind of see how our reading students scored in the state test this year, you can see our advanced plus, which is that little blue sliver right up in the middle. You can see our advanced is the black portion, and then our accomplished is the green portion. So you can you can see a little over uh, probably 30 percent right around there are scoring in that area, and then you have about 25 percent scoring proficient in regards to the district. I think that's a good um, good uh, diagram for the eye to kind of see where we're at. Now you can see, remember, achievement is how they scored on the test. You can also see the limited and basic there and then in the untested at the top with the yellow as you look to the um the graph or the chart to the right you can see our scores are still above state average however there are uh, room there is room for improvement and we look forward to doing that in the uh in the in the year ahead now as i move on um, we can look at the diagrams over the course of the years and how we are doing you can see again the top scores are at the very top and then the lowest scores are down at the bottom. So you can kind of see what our trend is over the course of the last few years. Now, what's interesting is, if anything, our higher scoring did go up a little bit, 
However, you can see our proficient also grew. So it's kind of a it's a it's a balancing act where you want students to grow and you want them to score high, and that's what the next slide is going to try to uh, represent as well. So when we talk about progress. This would be that value added piece that you may have heard about in previous years. This is a this is something where it truly talks about how our students are growing. Now, it's hard sometimes they say to grow high level students. Now, this data that's all put together in the, in an organization in North Carolina really projects how these students are going to score. You can see the concern is that we received a two star rating. Now, of course, that shows significant evidence that we fell short on our growth expectations. Now, when we start looking at the data points, I'll show you a little bit more. Now, the data points can show from negative 20 to plus 20. Plus 20 is the, obviously the highest growth that you can get. So. This is the first thing I'm going to show you, though, is um, the progress that we have. You can see the grade level and the colors. So over to the right, um, you have red, orange, green, blue, and then the darker um, blue or black right there. And you can see um, we've made some we've made proficient growth in, in our lower grades. And then as we get older, something's going on that obviously is a bit of concern and which will which will address probably in January. And I know the buildings are already beginning to address that as well. OK, now I'm going to go to this slide real quick. So you can see our growth index over to the right there. You can see our negative, and it's not that far negative. It can go all the way down to negative 20, and you can see that we're right there in the game, I think, with negative one. However, we want that to be on the positive side. And that's, of course, the for all of the areas in our district for those students in those subgroup categories that you see there. Now, when it comes to gap closing, there's four, there's actually six areas. The, they are ELA, academic achievement and growth, math academic achievement and growth, graduation, and then our ELL students. Now, we don't have enough ELL students to be a part of that um, grade, um, so they took, oh, I forgot, chronic absenteeism and gifted performance as well. So we didn't have enough to score in the ELL, so they scored the rest of those. And we scored a four star, which means basically that our progress for those areas and those long-term things are actually working out very well in the gap closing that the state um, is taking a look at. You can see the, the parentheses are the number of school districts that fell into those other categories as well. So you can see in this area, we're in the four star category. And when you look at the reading closing the gap, you can see um, whether we've met the goal or not. Um, to the left there, I talked already about the progress being made, but the achievement there um, to the left, you can see we've met a lot of areas in regards to those subgroups that exist there. Um, and we're looking forward to getting those scores up a little bit higher as well. Um, in the in the PowerPoint, I'm not going to go over this right now. There is league and district comparison, and I think uh, Ms. Mrs. Kuhn went over some of those things already in regards to how we fell in those categories. Reading was it was more middle of the road, if not maybe lower of the road in the district. But when it came to um, our comparison districts, I'm sorry, the first one was about the league. When it came to our comparison districts um, in the state, we we fell probably in the middle range. All right, Bill and I had the opportunity to look at our math scores through our district. If Tim could open this link for me. So we compared the 20 similar districts that was offered to us by the state. Um, we just compiled this as all proficient scores and above. Um, so if you look at the 20 scores of the different schools, and then at the bottom, we, we figured out where we fell in each grade and tested area. Um, so we were as high as five out of 21 in the fifth grade, and we were as low as 19 out of 21 in our third grade and then our geometry scores. Um, one school offers the integrated math one and two, uh, but all the other offer the algebra and geometry. The next thing we charted was our trend data. Um, again, we didn't have scores in 2020, 
So with the five years and four scores, um, each color is a different trend that, that we scored. Um, our geometry there at the bottom um, is on the upswing. Um, and the fourth grade, again, you can see there at the top. That way. There we go. Uh, so this is an analysis of, of the growth data within math. And again, it brings in the, the 20 uh, other comparable schools. Uh, there's lots of colors up here to look at. The, the two colors I would tell you to focus on is the, the darker color, uh, probably looks like a gray to you. It's actually supposed to be a dark green. Uh, and then the red is the other one to pay attention to. The, the darker color, this is significant evidence that students have uh, made the progress that they're expected to make, the red being there's significant evidence that they made less progress uh, than they were supposed to make. And then we divided this up within uh, each grade and each assessment as well. So you could see, you know, per grade and then per comparative school district, um, you know, how the different schools or how we compare to those different schools as far as expected growth. And then our last slide, you know, as Mr. Newlove did a really nice job uh, of talking about, you know, gap closing and what that means. Uh, this looks at math achievement uh, with those subcategories over here to the left. And then again, with the, uh, the, the growth index scores, um, you know, with those negative numbers that we want to push closer to, uh, to zero and then into the positive. But uh, this is two graphs that explain uh, that math achievement and gap closing as well. So I'll talk to you a little bit about our um, gifted report card components. So the first thing uh, that uh, our report card components come in the gap closing section. So we contribute up to 15 points to gap closing overall. And each of those sections, performance index, value added, and service and um, identification ratios, those are all all or nothing kind of point values. So sometimes people ask me, uh, this year we received no points, none of the five points for service and identification of gifted kids, um, which is very defeating and deflating to me, I'll just be honest, because that's what I do every day. So, you know, we identify um, 384 kids, 425 kids, um, we service 84% of those kids, um, but it's an all or nothing thing. So the ratios don't pan out this year. Uh, one of the biggest problems is that they created a um, kind of a, a matrix or rubric system that gives more weight to identifying students in the primary grades, K-1 and 2, and we start identification in January of second grade. So we identify all those students in the spring of second grade. Um, they don't start services till third grade, so we lose a considerable amount of points in that service matrix there. We also lose points for service in high school, primarily because a lot of our students, when I pull up their schedules and take a look at what they're doing, they're doing fantastic and fabulous things. Our gifted kids are at Heidelberg, they're at Tara, they're taking great classes with Mr. Mansoor that may not match up to the area of gifted identification. So if they're identified in um, science, but they're taking AP Lang with Ms. Rindler, that's not a gifted service, can't count that. So the more offerings, and this board has been historically supportive um, well beyond my 17 years of providing fantastic opportunities. So I don't want those numbers to ever make it look like our kids aren't taking rich, wonderful courses and experiences. Um, one example I gave Mr. Richards was we had a, fr a freshman identified only in science and he's out at Sentinel for a VOAG program. He's studying agriculture, he's in agricultural science, 
that's not a gifted service. It's a great placement for that kid. So um, professional development is required as well for anything to count as a gifted service. So the state has changed that number, but we stick with 60 hours in the first two years for any gen ed teacher that's providing a gifted service. They do book studies primarily with me. Um, our performance index, I don't know if I put much up there about that, but our performance index, um, we went up huge from 2021 to 2022. Our gifted students scored, as Ms. Kuhn talked about, performance index is a formula of how many students score accelerated and advanced and basic on their tests. So we had 387 accountable tests last year for gifted and talented students identified, and uh, they met 93% of the total possible performance index. So there's 120 possible points. They were 93% of the way there. You have to be 95% of the way there to get those five gap closing points. So just under the mark, um, but for historical reference in 2021, um, we only had a 109 for our performance index for gifted kids, which I also think speaks to why our teachers are so such a valuable component. That COVID learning loss from not having an instructor in the classroom really hit those gifted hit kids hard. I'm, I'm warmed to see the, the rebound happening for that. And we did meet value added, probably because we jumped up so much on that performance index. Um, value added for gifted is a ratio of how, you know, how fast you're growing compared to all the other gifted identified kids in the state. Um, another thing is just, I was asked to talk about a little bit was the uh, AP participation versus CCP participation. College Credit Plus is not really in my arena because it is open to all students seventh grade or higher um, that meet qualifications for each university. Um, but I did a little digging and it is, it's hugely popular, probably three to four times more popular than AP participation right now. Um, but we have had, we've opened our gates a little bit for AP to students that, um, come from a little more underrepresented populations, uh, took away some of the prerequisites and things. And so we're seeing those numbers go up every year as well. So lots of participation for both of those. Good evening. We're gonna briefly discuss four components of special education. We're gonna talk a little bit about student numbers, placements, partnerships, and then finally special education ratings and profiles. So as we relate to numbers, TCS serves a little over 350 students with special needs that are served through individualized education plans. We also serve 74 students via 504 plans which provide access to the environment and the general education curriculum. Generally speaking, we run parallel to state averages in both the percentage of total number of students identified and served, and also pretty parallel when we look at the number of students uh, by percentage of 12 of the 13 disability categories. The one category that stands out is that TCS currently serves twice the state average, a little more than twice the state average when we look at students who are receiving services for speech language impairment. Placements. We are responsible for serving and providing a free appropriate public education for all students with special needs. All of those students, 350 of them, have placements within the continuum of special education. Some of those placements are inside the district and some of those are outside the district. So we are directly or indirectly responsible for providing those placements. Most of our students are served within the district. However, we do have outside placements. We have students placed at several programs, the LEAP program, uh, TDC, the School of Opportunity, and others. The district also has one student that's actually receiving special education services in the state of Kentucky. Some of these placements, like the state placement in Kentucky, are governed by outside agencies, court placement where the district and the Board of Education have little to no say in those educational placements, but we are responsible to ensure free appropriate public education and bear the costs of those services. Next, we wanna talk a little bit about our partnerships. How is it that we go about serving students with disabilities? We have established a number of partnerships that help us serve and provide educational opportunities for students with disabilities. Some of those partnerships include the ESC, 
a number of state support teams throughout the state, uh, Office for Exceptional Children, community partnerships such as PT services who provide related services for our students with disabilities. Um, and as together, we work aggregately with them and all of our partners. Additionally, we work with specific people from the ESC, Aaron Simmons being one of them, to create a parent organization to provide education and support for our families. That just kicked off this fall with the help of Aaron, her team, um, the entire district staff. We had representatives from all phases of student services and Michelle Tuitt present at that uh, program. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about special education ratings and profiles. Annually, each district and community school in the state receives a rating and a profile. These reports are released, generally speaking, in September and December of each year. The ratings focus on compliance and the profile focus more on student achievement. When we look historically, the last five years of TCS, the five-year ratings for compliance, TCS has met minimal compliance. We had three minor hiccups where we received corrective action plans, two of which were indicator 11, which are timely evaluations specific to initial evaluations for eligibility for special education. One of those did fall during the COVID year, and we are not the only ones that had that hit just due to um, Office for Special Education Programs did not relinquish any of the responsibility to provide timely evaluations during COVID. The last one that we received a corrective action plan for was due to uh, free appropriate public education for a student who was placed outside of the district. All of those corrective action plans are either finished and completed and or will be completed by the end of December. When we look at the profile, the five-year rating for Tiffin City Schools hit a high in 2017, where we met 75% of the metrics. As the years have gone on from 2017 to currently, a number of additional metrics have been added. Those focus primarily on student achievement. Currently, TCS sits with a 54% of metrics met. We are continuing to focus on the education and service delivery of students with disabilities. We have an outside, outstanding dedicated staff and we will continue to focus on how we can support the staff in order to increase learning opportunities for students with disabilities. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, the next component on the local report card is the graduation rate. And the graduation rate is comprised of our four-year adjusted cohort graduation rate and our five-year. And I first should say that the four-year grad, this is based on the class of 2021. So for the four-year graduation rate, they looked at students who graduated in 2021 who started their ninth grade year in 2017. And for the five-year graduation rate, they looked at students who graduated in 2021 who started their freshman year in 2016. Those two combined together gave us our graduation rate. And you can see we got a four-star rating for that. Um, and you can see the distribution of, of those ratings throughout the state. Um, the thing I did want to talk about, though, when you start talking about graduation rate, I thought it'd be good to go over what the graduation requirements are because they've changed dramatically over the years. So if you look at screen, over on the left, this is 2018. And back in 2018, the graduation requirements were three things. You could score 18 points, and what that means is 18 points on the end of course exams, which there are seven of them at that time, ELA 1, ELA 2, Algebra, Geometry, Biology, American History, and Government. You earn the score between one and five, three is proficient. You earn 18 points, you met graduation requirements. That along with the State of Ohio requires 20 credits. Uh, locally, we require 21. So you meet your credits, you get 18 points, or you earn an industry credential, which comes basically from a vocational program or you earn a remediation score on your AC, a remediation free score on the ACT or SAT. 
what happened was in 2018, there was a little bit of an uproar because those three things right there, a, a lot of districts were a little worried that the graduation rate would drop. Um, especially if you're a student, it didn't make sense. If you're a good student, you score remediation free. If you didn't score 18 points and you didn't do well on the end of course, you're probably not gonna earn a remediation free ACT or SAT score. So because of that uproar, uh, the state came back and aided, added the additional nine uh, pathways, attendance, GPA, capstone. If you earned two of those nine and you didn't earn the, one of the three, you, you met requirements. That settled the masses down a little bit, so much so that in 2019, they said, we're gonna keep those requirements. In 2020, they kept the same requirements, but you can see the pathways, they took attendance off, they better defined like a GPA 2.5 in 11th and 12th grade, they added the community service 120 hours, things of that, they defined some of those a little bit more. In 2021, they dropped those pathways and just said those three things, meet one of those three things again. In 2022, this past year, students could either choose the old requirements, one of the three, or the new requirements, which is to the right here, your 20 credits, here we have 21, uh, a competency score of a 284, um, that should be a 684, excuse me, 684 on ELA 1 and Algebra 1, end of course, and you must earn two seals, one being the state. The seals are those down there, and I'll go over them quick in a second. Point I wanted to make is you can see the graduation requirements changed a lot over the years, and I know I wasn't here, but I know the high school I was at, we had three different graduation requirements for four grades and that can be a, a tracking nightmare, not to mention in 2020, we did not test uh, state tests. So then the state came in and said, we can use grades, a grade replacement. It, it, it's still um, very hard tracking. So I did just wanna bring that up. Um, this is just a, a handout here that, that we made up about the graduate. You can see why it's very hard for parents, students to know uh, what the requirements are. So we try and get that out as much as we can. Um, the graduation seals, the new requirements, they have to earn two seals, one being state. Um, the farthest one to the left is seal of biliteracy. Students have to show competency in ELA 2 as well as another language to get that seal. The citizen citizenship seal, they must earn a proficient score on the American history and government end of course, or a B grade or higher in both to get that. Uh, the college readiness seal, uh, you gotta have a, a remediation free ACT or SAT score. The fine art community service seal, that's a local seal. We determine that to be 120 hours of community service. Fine arts and performance seal, locally, you have to earn two credits in visual or fine performing arts. Honors diploma, there are six honors diplomas that a student can earn in the state of Ohio. If you earn one of those, you earn that seal. Industry uh, recognized credential, again, that's more for our vocational students earning an industry seal or credential. Military enlistment, proof of uh, enlistment in the military, you get that seal. Ohio means job seal is um, students have to demonstrate 14 personal skills and it needs to be verified by either school, work, or community member. Uh, the science seal, you need to earn a proficient score in a biology or a grade of a B or higher on an AP or CCP course. And student engagement seal is complete four extracurriculars in your high school years. And the last one is a technology seal where if you earn a uh, passing score on a CCP course uh, or complete a high school course that meets all the technology requirements. So those are the seals. So again, now you have to earn that 684 competency score and two of these seals. Our four-year graduation rate, 2021, we had a 92.9. Five-year, we had a 96.7. 
Here's a historic trend of our graduation rate. You can see to the left is 2017, and then you got 2018, 2019. We reached a peak, and then you can see it begin to drop for 2020. There was a little bit of a drop there. Um, not sure what that is, but I just showed you all the requirements, and um, that could have came into play as well as COVID. Our graduation rate when compared to similar districts, uh, Ms. Kuhn uh, talked about our similar districts there to the left. If you look on the graph to the right, the blue is our district. So this past report card, we had 92.9, which is higher than all of our similar districts and um, better than the state average. And our five year was the same. And the little note I made to the right there is that our four and five year graduation rate was also higher than similar district for the previous two years as well. This is another component on the report card, college, career, workforce, and military readiness. This isn't gonna appear until the 24-25 report card, but what it does is it's all these factors right here, and so they take the graduating cohort, and if a student earns any one of these things, we get a point, any one of them. So they take that, for example, class of 2021, we had 92 points out of 196 students, and that was our rate, 46.9. I can't tell you how that compares to others because we're not, that's not a part of the grade card yet. But just wanted to give you guys a heads up there. And as far as course offerings, I'm not gonna go through them all, but this is what Tiffin Columbian High School has. And you can see, for example, our, I put 14 courses. Didn't list all the courses, I just kind of highlighted some. Uh, what I see is that looking at our class sizes, I'd like to be able to, um, as well as Mr. Richards, like to, to add some more elective courses. I think we got enough room from class sizes and maybe uh, reducing the section that we might be able to pick up some electives that way. I would also like to see uh, possibly giving, offering courses that would earn a seal. For example, technology. If we, if we offer a technology course that meets all the state requirements, right? Anybody who takes that course will get the technology seal right off the bat, right? There's one seal done and accounted for. And, and, and our goal is to, by the time they're seniors, have them meet their two goals, have them meet the competency scores. So really all they have to do is pass their classes and earn credit. So that's, that's the direction we'd like to go. Mr. Lutz is gonna talk about the middle school. I won't, I won't read all through these, but <clears throat> obviously here are the course offerings here at the Tiffin Middle School. And again, we want to seamlessly transition from the middle school to the high school. So in a lot of ways, prepare our students with like courses. And so something cool we are able to do down here at the middle school is offer high school credit um, without leaving the building. But we also are offering high school credit possibilities with leaving the building with support, obviously, through our transportation department and you guys. Um, Electives, you can see there's obviously a handful of electives, which again have changed just in my short career here in the building over the last six and seven years uh, from where we were to again, things that we're able to offer our students, which again are really cool as far as the STEM, the ed tech courses, again, looking at more science, technology and math um, options. Um, and then something I think worth noting as well, um, we have a very strong PBIS program uh, at the high school, middle school and below and um, something that we have um, off of the last two years is something called pit time, personal improvement time. And it's that 18 minute gap uh, from lunch back to our classrooms um, because of, again, size of uh, spaces through lunch and being able to allow time to clean up for the next group of students coming in. Uh, there is kind of a 18 minute gap there uh, where our students, you know, could be offered nothing or could be offered something. Right now we're doing twice a week, which is uh, sustained silent reading. Three days a week, uh, we're offering uh, character development options, opportunities, um, and then also, again, just per grade level, uh, certain incentives where they can go outside as a sixth grader because maybe they need more of that time or um, you know, earning some certain type of rewards and stuff. So it's kind of that flex time that's being pretty valuably used um, with drills and those sorts of things.
Good evening. I was asked to do some research on our student development, our student involvement. Um, so first thing I did was take 2021 and 2022 to try to get some numbers to see uh, student involvement in our athletic programs at Columbian. Uh, we had 42% of our students engaged in uh, athletics at Columbian and 47% at TMS. Uh, so I went ahead and looked at the fall for this year and uh, numbers are are a little bit lower, but that's only our first first uh, part of our uh, athletic season. 35% of the total combined between TMS and uh, Tiffin Columbian, 35% of our students are involved in sports. As we get into our winter now and into spring, I, I believe our numbers should stay pretty close to the same. We have 22 varsity sports available at Columbian and 10, at, 10 uh, athletic or sporting sports available at Tiffin Middle School. Extracurricular clubs uh, and extracurricular activities. Um, 2000, uh, so far this year, we have 460 out of 884 uh, involved at Columbian and 27% um, at TMS for a total of seven through 12. About 44% of our student students are involved into an extracurricular or an activity. Um, and then below are just some of the different activities and clubs that we offer. Thank you. Uh, my first slide here is showing how we clean our buildings with our custodial staff. Uh, we're really struggling right now with getting the five hour night sweeper positions filled because we're just the amount of money we're paying and people don't want to work the part time jobs anymore. Uh, this is what we're currently using to maintain our grounds here at the school system and maintenance. We're down one position right now. And I'm really looking forward to working with TDA and the architects to work with our community to come up with a game plan for the Tiffin City Schools building and grounds. Good evening. Transportation, um, with the change this year, the double routing has really helped us tremendously with the staffing that we were headed into this year without that. Though we did do the double routing, um, it, it did increase our daily driven miles to up 283 miles from previous years. Um, I really believe that with some optimization of the routes over the next couple of years, uh, our efficiency will get better. We may be able to lower that a little bit. TCS Transportation Services over eight, eight different schools um, with yellow school buses. One other school, as Mr. Nadeau mentioned, to the LEAP program. We do transport to there, but it is in taxi. But we do provide service to eight different school districts or eight different buildings with yellow school buses. Due to several different factors this year, um, we have incurred a driver shortage currently. We're utilizing three long-term subs to drive two unfilled routes at the present time. <clears throat> so we're still in a need for more bus drivers and more subs. I'll talk a little bit about technology. I'm not gonna go through all the slides. Uh, my, our current con, uh, objective uh, for technology is to continue staying within our budget. It has not changed uh, since 2018. Uh, although we know that uh, technology changes year to year and it gets more advanced and, and also uh, is much more needed throughout the school district. Uh, we have found different ways of gathering that money. Uh, we've had uh, help through our ESSER funds, uh, which has helped out with the one-to-one -one Chromebooks. Uh, we also were able to, this year for the first time, sell off some of our, we call it carcasses. This is after we have taken parts and pieces from uh, different machines and uh, sold them to the public. Uh, a lot of school districts are doing that now. This is just giving you an idea of what our operating budget is and what we've added to it uh, by selling off some of those items. 
and our current objective right now is is continually selling off those parts and uh, uh, getting rid of those up the, our unusable pieces and uh, anything that is uh, not usable. Uh, we make sure that instead of just uh, selling it by scrap, by poundage, we're actually able to sell it for uh, a decent amount of money. Uh, the platforms that we use right now, we're using uh, Macs, we're also using Windows, and uh, we're also using Google. Uh, currently, right now, we are at uh, about 80% uh, Chromebooks, 15% uh, Macs, and that's with the teachers, and we're at 5% with Windows. In the past, anybody that knows, uh, we were at one time reversed. We were about 80% Macs. Uh, that's changed with due to uh, COVID. We also have other platforms that we're using. Uh, that would be uh, Google Workspace for education. That would be for the uh, elementaries. And we're using Clever for the elementaries, K through 8. And then we're also using Canvas for grades 9 through 12. This is just giving you an idea of the way the workforce is right now. Uh, a lot of that has happened due to COVID. Uh, the workforce has changed over time. Uh, everyone's working from home and uh, everything's being done through remote. So as the workforce has changed, so has the way we've educated our students, uh, preparing them more for uh, a career outside. Uh, we can see that it has uh, kind of peaked and it's starting to drop now. Uh, with uh, the uh, technology, the way things are, we have to be prepared for the future. And by doing that, we also need to uh, be ahead of ourselves and know that what we have to prepare for our teachers is to uh, always be there for their support. And uh, that is by uh, possibly by STEM and also uh, through uh, uh, management with uh, their mock uh, accounts with uh, using that possibly in the high school. Uh, another way is also by social media, preparing them for uh, working with customers outside their uh, homes. Where are we going with the district? Uh, hopefully down the road, maybe we can uh, assist in uh, providing maybe some classes in the Chromebook repair. And uh, that'll be determined by, of course, the, uh, the teachers and also the um, education board. What are some of the challenges we face? I've already gone over that with you, of course, is where do we uh, get the funding for that and to continue with the one-to-one. -one. Uh, we've already discussed that and I won't go over that again. And uh, we did try an approach for the teachers. Uh, we did bring out some Chromebooks. They were a little more advanced. And we tried those out uh, to see if we could maybe uh, uh, replace those in place of the MacBook Pros. The teachers weren't uh, able to get all the apps to work with their other pieces of equipment, like the uh, uh, touch screens and also the testing generator equipment that they use. Uh, it wasn't uh, uh, feasible. So uh, we dropped the idea of using uh, Chromebooks at this point. What are some of the other things that we face uh, with the, uh, the uh, classroom space? We know that uh, if we're going to be uh, having anything like a, a, a Google repair shop or something like that, that'll be something that we'll have to discuss down the road. All right, good evening. We're in the home stretch. Anybody need to stretch out or stand up for a moment? Um, I'm gonna talk just briefly about um, some financial comparisons. And you know, over the last 45 minutes to an hour, you heard about all these services, supports, um, programs that we offer uh, our students, staffs, and families. Um, so how does, how does Tiffin City Schools stack up with not only area schools, but SBC schools and some, some of our similar districts. So this first slide here looks at uh, area schools. There are eight of those area schools. Um, and down at the bottom, 
where you see Tiffin City Schools, the number in parentheses, that indicates our placement out of those eight schools. So in that first column, teacher average salary, Tiffin City is seven out of eight. Uh, the second one, building operations, eight, so on and so forth. Um, and when you look at the, the slides, these next few slides, you're gonna start to see uh, a trend here. With SBC schools, again, out of the six schools, you look at uh, Tiffin City Schools there at the bottom, uh, six, you, you, the, the trend is gonna be we're, we're at the bottom uh, or near the bottom of just about every category except for two. And those two would be purchase services uh, and the uh, support staff expenditures where um, we are towards the top half and top ranking in those areas. And then the final grouping, similar districts, again, out of those schools, which were eight again, Tiffin City uh, in most areas is down towards the bottom of each of those different groupings, uh, with the exception of, again, purchase services and support expenditures. Next slide here um, shows where Tiffin City School ranks with performance index. Um, so Bellevue is number one with performance index rank. Uh, and the expenditures that they put forth towards that ranking. And you can see where Tiffin City Schools uh, is fifth, uh, only ahead of Sandusky, and um, at the lowest end of our expenditures for that area. Um, oh, this is Mr. Richards. So this, to try to tie it all back together, this is a graphic that can be found on the state report card. Um, we didn't make up this graphic, but this is the blue dots that you see represent all of the districts in the state of Ohio. So going upwards is performance index, going left to right is expenditure per pupil. If we were average on performance and average on expenditure, we would be where those two red lines bisect one another. I think I used the correct term for math. Mr. Alvarado, am I correct with bisect? Okay, thank you, just checking. Um, where those lines bisect is where you wanna be. Um, that's average for everything. Uh, the ideal is to be as high up and to the left as possible. That's the goal. That means you're spending very little and you're getting a really high return with student performance. The place that you don't wanna be is down and to the right because it means you're spending a lot and you're, and you're not getting a lot. Uh, what you will find is you can see we are that red dot of all of those, and, and you will see there are not many dots to the left of us. Um, and I will explain that here. Actually, I'll do it now. Out of the 607 school districts in the state, public school districts in the state of Ohio, there are 16 of them that spend less per pupil than Tiffin City Schools. If you were to translate that into percentages, that would be we are in the bottom 3% of expenditure per pupil in the state of Ohio. And I'm pretty sure Mr. Alvarado can check me 17 out of 607. I'm pretty sure it's still under 3%. If I'm wrong, he'll correct me later. So when we talk about performance and cost, and the next slide is where it ties it together. This is on the state report card as well. Are we among the 20% of public districts with the lowest operating expense per pupil? Yes, absolutely we are. Are we among the 20% of public districts with the highest academic performance index score? No, we are not. Um, what I will tell you as a statistics person uh, that enjoys statistics, I'm not a mathematician like Mr. Alvarado, um, but what I can tell you, it is not, it does not equal, spending more money does not equal higher performance, but it does help. Um, it, it, it isn't as simple as to say, spend more money, you're gonna get more achievement. It doesn't work that way. But I think we can tell pretty clearly by looking at the data points and going back to this, you can kind of almost make out a correlation there. And yet again, correlation does not equal causality. Uh, Dr. Frost will appreciate me saying that. Uh, correlation does not equal causality, but there is a relationship between expenditure per pupil and behind student performance. So with that being said, um, we're gonna close. Anybody that's watching at home, 
Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Mrs. Spar loved typing this up today to put on the comment section. Anybody can email her the question. Mrs. Spar is not going to be the one to answer the question, but she will work to make certain work with me to make sure we get that question to the appropriate person to get you an answer. Uh, but with no further ado, and we won't all come up to the microphone, uh, but if the board had any questions for any of us over the data that we've presented or any of the data that we didn't present, uh, we'd be happy to answer that at this time. Uh, we'll just have people stand up where they are and, and use their use their teacher voices to to be able to project. But I would like to also I, I, I said at the onset I should say it again. I would like to sincerely thank uh, the members of the leadership team. As you saw, some of them had to work in groups. Some of them it was a group project. Some people had to work individually. Um, and we're happy to make changes to this moving forward. But I think having a an annual examination of our data and just kind of where we are is helpful. Moving forward, if there are things that people wanted to see and less of other things, uh, we're happy to make alterations to that, but we wanted to be somewhat comprehensive in our first go around. So to all the members of the leadership team that put in a lot of hard work to this, I'd like to thank them all publicly as well for all of the work that they've done and for being here today on the first Monday back from Thanksgiving. They are so happy to be at the board meeting tonight. Uh, they all said, Mr. Richards, can we please stay? Uh, for the whole board meeting and we said no you, you guys could go afterwards but uh, I'd like to really thank them for all the hard work that they've done that was an awesome impressive report I too would like to thank everybody I've been in this district a long time I've never seen the data presented like it was tonight so kudos to everyone I do have a couple questions the first one is, why do we feel that we are so high in speech language impairment? That one really shocked me. Mr. Nadeau, you can just use your big boy voice. <laughs> I think there's a couple of theories. We don't have any direct relationship. Um, I would say that some of that has to do with the reevaluation process that occurred during COVID. We're not an anomaly. There, there was some... Uh, there was some percentage of reevaluation to reevaluation to, to eligibility of special education that were waived. Uh, what you would tend to see is that some students who qualify for speech language impairment are, are focused on articulation, and those tend to not stay on uh, as eligible for services. But because of that, the waiving of those due to COVID, I think that adds to it. And secondly, I think there's a component to uh, what metrics and, and evaluations are we using in order to identify, and are we truly looking at what is the root cause of the barriers that the student may be experiencing at that time? Most of our uh, students with disabilities that are under the SLI category are in the primary grades, so K through four. And so I think we have to look at how we're evaluating and then see as this progresses, now that we'll be able to conduct our, our just regular primary review, if that number continues. Thank you. I still got the hot seat, okay. Um, this is from Mr. Alvarado, CCP classes. How many of those are taught five days a week in the high school building as compared to three days a week at one of the universities? Well, Mr. Montour teaches five days a week, and then we bring in Tip University three days a week for three classes. And I think my assumption is true that if they go to one of the universities for CCP, they meet three times a week for a semester, an hour a day for a full credit. In my opinion, that's a big difference. Five days a week for an hour a day for a year as compared to three days a week for an hour a day for a semester for the same credit. I know we can't do anything about that. That's something the state of Ohio put on us. I think we were much better off when we had post-secondary options for six-tenths of a credit for a semester's work as compared to giving people a full credit 
for a semester of work, which means you could take four years of English in two through CCP, and that's really good for parents when it goes to college tuition, but I'm not sure about the education that the kids are getting when we're cutting that much time. The other thing for Mr. Alvarado was 2019, and again, the COVID gets me screwed up, but I think one of the reasons 2019 was so high is we had no testing, we just wanted to get kids graduated. I believe that was the case. Okay. Okay, thank you. So Mr. Kisbeth, just so you know, the data shows that the most popular courses for our kids to take via CC Plus um, would be composition, English composition, psychology, sociology, and college algebra. Those are the most common courses that our kids, our, our courses, our kids take. I, I think it's also important while I have a, a potential audience of who knows how many people will watch this later on, um, if people want to watch my head spin, and the board will probably understand this, when people say that CC Plus is free, that is not the case. Uh, my grandfather, who's no longer living, uh, would say there is nothing in life that is free, and he is correct. Uh, it is free to parents. That's a true statement. Uh, CC Plus is free to parents. Parent Kids can get college credits, and there is no cost to the parent. So long as they pass. So long as they pass, correct. But the... But that bill is paid by the school district and by the taxpayers of the school district. So the more kids that we have that are taking CC Plus, and I don't have a problem with CC Plus. I think it's a great opportunity for a lot of our students. But when people talk about different costs, there is, a, there is an actual cost. So when people say it's free, let's be careful. It is free, provided they pass, to the parents and the students. It is not necessarily free it's in fact not necessary. It is not free to the school district, um, and our costs keep going up each year for CCP. Uh, that's something to know as well. Yeah, I just had a couple questions. Um, <clears throat> have we um, thought about uh, um, in terms of uh, maintenance and bus drivers uh, uh, limitations? Um, could we outsource that? Any of that? I mean, ask a, a private entity to. Provide. Yeah. So, could those be done? Yeah. I mean, there's. Sh sure. I mean, the, the answer well, I is. Guess the, 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 the question, the, I, I guess, is comes down to: Could we do it in a cost-effective way so that we don't apply? We're not uh, providing state retirement system, uh, funds. So you're you're asking a private entity, who may have different uh, benefits package, to allow uh, to fill those slots. So I, I do know that there are districts that have done that. Um, what, how much of a cost savings? And, and I will tell you anecdotally, um, most of those districts say that they do it for the purpose of being a cost savings. Um, I think that's uh, something that we would have to explore, and I'd want to work with the Board of Education to decide if that's a direction that we would ever want to look at going. Um, I can tell you that that's an issue that will bring up a lot of passion and emotion as an argument. Uh, but I think as we, as we continue to look forward, uh, I think Dr. Gase, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, you, you're very adept at doing that on, on your own, but I think the question is, are we, should we look and uncover every rock um, for possibilities? Is uh, I think yeah, what you're saying, just I, to I explore. Think, you know, the, the fact is if we're gonna provide the, the continued Busing services, and that's another question. Do mm -hmm. we provide that amount of busing? But if we are going to do that, then we got to have drivers. And if we're going to have a, a, a maintenance provided facilities, we got to have maintenance workers. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we got to pay more. If, if to have to not have that is not acceptable. Correct. Then a segue to the next question I had um, is that also correlate with why we have so much purchased services? A lot of our purchase services um, go through a, a lot of its special education. We have an awful lot of, of students attending other buildings. Uh, 
there's what's called the least restrictive environment on an IEP. It is our legal obligation to make certain that students are, are educated in the least restrictive environment. That means as close to Tiffin as possible and preferably through Tiffin City Schools. Um, and there are gonna be times in any district um, almost even super, super large districts have a hard time saying they are going to be the LRE for absolutely every student. But I think in talking to Mr. Nadeau, I think it would be a, a hope of ours to eventually make certain we look at our services that we are providing so that we are the LRE. Um, we have some students attending some, some other locations right now. Uh, I, I'm thinking of a text message that uh, Mrs. Tewitt sent me even the other day. Or actually, no, that was Mr. Newlove, I think. I apologize. Uh, Mr. Newlove sent, and, and we have a student attending a, a, another school right now and, it, and is thriving and doing exceptionally well. That's fantastic. That's what we love to be able to see. Uh, we cannot be all things for absolutely every kid. There are going to be schools that can do it better than us and more cost effectively. Uh, but I think if we can do it better in, in house and also be more cost efficient, that those are avenues and opportunities that we have to explore on how to move our district forward. Um, yet again, not two prongs. One, making certain that we're providing an even better service to students. And two, if we can do that and be more cost efficient in that process. Yeah, just to, I've been looking at the com com comparisons with other yes. districts. And so, you know, we're using more outside services than, say, Old Ford percentage wise, New Regal. Yes. Uh, you know, Mohawk, these these are much smaller districts than ours, mm -hmm. and yet we're outsourcing. Re so, so you know, I really would like to see the breakdown on where that, okay. you know, are we uh, are we bypassing something? Are we, are we doing that because we don't want to hire in because we couldn't, we couldn't get somebody or because we're, we're trying to do things that, yeah. Oh, you got um, Dr. Geese, if I could add, um, one of the largest increases that we've had in purchase services just in the last couple of years is serving the students at the Tiffin Developmental Center. Those are students coming in from other districts, and we provide that program through um, the ESC, so that's a purchase service. So um, you'll see on my forecast that that has risen greatly um, because that's about $1.4 million a year. But then we're reimbursed for those right. students from okay. their That's, districts yeah. in the following right. year. So that that number's definitely gone up. Okay, for that'd that be reason. good to know mm -hmm. it, because that's yeah. basically the past. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, because it's still reported as a purchase service, even though we get reimbursed in the next year. And one other thing that I want to respond to as far as outsourcing for maintenance or bus drivers, we would not be able to circumvent um, state retirement. Um, system, they would still be considered members of the state retirement system, so we would have to pay that cost through the vendor. That's that's a yeah. law. That's a state law. Yeah, that's okay. a state law. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, then the last question, I, um, uh, we, we, we mentioned about space for technology. Um, what do, we, do we have any plans for, for that? I mean, we don't have a new facility uh, for quite a long time, at least yeah. at the high school level. Uh, do we have any plans for changing the room? Yeah, I think I think we're going to have to. Uh, man, Doctor Gase, you're kind of outing me here, but uh, it's fine. Uh, I think we're we're kind of looking at some different opportunities for where we can start stealing some space, um, because we are going to have to be more creative right, right. Uh, with that. And so, I'm not ready to present that to the board at this time, uh, but because uh, we're still just trying to look at options. But I hope to come to you in the not too distant future to be able to talk about how we can possibly capture some additional uh, square footage so we can provide some different opportunities for our students. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you all for the presentation. It's been, I think, eye-opening to see this all kind of wrapped up for us in the community. Um, the comparisons with our neighbors, I think was, again, eye-opening and kind of uh, upsetting, I think. I think we think we're capable of a lot more. We know our kids are capable of a lot more because we see them every day. And uh, just seeing them on that axis and seeing them as dots instead of the kids that we see, um, we know they're better than that. Mm -hmm. um, so I know you said there's no causation and correlation, but really at some point we have to decide as a community whether or not they're worth the investment. Agreed. And what they're doing right now with the investment we have, I think is a reflection on them, 
not on us as a community because I think they're overperforming for what we give them. And, and we can't rely on that. I think, unfortunately, looking at that graph, they're closer to being less than average than they are closer to being above average. So it'll be easier for them to slip down than it is for them to be better than or better performing mm -hmm. than our mm -hmm. neighbors and the same kids that they'll be competing with for employment. So I think that I think was eye opening. And I do thank the numbers on the extracurricular activities, both the athletics on that. I think that was shocking for me. I think I suspected it, but that is actually to me, it seems a really high involvement. That's not what I was used to. And again, it, it shows that these kids are willing to use the things that we provide them and the opportunities we give them. We just have to provide them more, which goes to what Dr. Gay said. With the technology, I can't believe we're talking about adding tech classes. It's 2022. Are, are we trying to find out ways to fall behind other districts? You know, again, we've got to be proactive, I think, as a community to put our kids out first ahead of these other districts. Um, we only get one chance to do it. Uh, looking at the slide, so I do have a question technically mm -hmm. on the, I believe it was the one that uh, was on gap closing, I think, Yeah. that had the subsets. Yes. And that were based on things like multiracial or yes. multicultural. And on the left side, it had different goals based on those subsets yes who comes up with those subset goals the state of ohio comes up with those they have a formula based upon how you did the previous year they have a projection as to how you should be the following year so, so it's a formula that the state of ohio gives for each district and that can be a different goal for each district depending upon how you did previously and i found that kind of disturbing as well because if you looked on there it had goals for all students yes and it had the lowest goals for hispanic students it had i think higher goals for different people yes. of different ethnicities and why is that supported or tolerated i mean all our students period should be expected to achieve at the same we should be able to put out the same product for everyone mm -hmm. and for the state to be coming up with those different lesser goals for different populations based on that or their income i think is just saying that we're accepting less and so I just wanted to make sure you said that came from the state. That, that came wasn't... from the state. And I will make sure I say that again publicly. Uh, that is not a metric that we at Tiffin City Schools created. That is a metric that is provided by the State Department of Education. But then again, I think I thank the entire staff for what I saw up there because it shows that you are involved in what you guys do with what you have. So thank you. And yeah, not really any uh, questions. I think we've, we've covered quite a few here. Um, I will say when uh, some of the state uh, the state report card came out, Mr. Richards approached us and you know showed us some of the um, the numbers and, and sort of challenged us to think about you know where we want to go, right? And I think this was a a really good overview of, uh, for the the community of where we are. Um, you know, where do we want to go? Do we want to raise our scores within those similar districts as identified by the state? Do we want to raise our scores within you know Seneca County and the region? um within the sbc right where, where do we really want to go i think we would all agree we always want to do better but now now i think we've got to guide mr richards on what we want to get better at and why right do we want to be the best school district in the state in the county in the city right i mean those, those are all questions we have to we have to now be able to answer for him because next year i think we'll all expect these numbers will be different but hopefully they'll be moved in a direction that we've guided the district that we want to move right um so i think that that's that's the next most important step for us as a as a board but thank you everybody who presented tonight we appreciate that thank you i'll just wrap us up with um i have one question i think we'll go to mr Alvarado. the graduation requirements you said that there was one year where every class had different graduation requirements is that stabling out is there any <laughs> Supposedly. Um, and then is there a maximum number of seals that students can earn? No. Interesting. They could earn all 12. Wow. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and then 
again, just echoing the board members here, uh, Mr. Richards and the, the entire team here, uh, the amount of collaboration and the amount of work that had to go into this to really take a deep dive to understand where our district has been, where it is, to be able to then set actual goals that are that are measurable and attainable and based off of fact and where we are. Um, this is an incredible amount of work and you're here on the Monday night after break, um, but it shows the dedication to the district, which I also think is shown in this, in showing the ways that we work with everybody from vulnerable students and our student athletes and our extracurriculars and every grade and every student and every family with some of the lowest funding, I think is um, a call to our community, but also it's an incredible shout out to, to the district and to those who are here serving and working with these kids and these families. So thank you all for, for this work and for giving us a foundation to be able to move forward with. Thank you. And thank you guys. This now brings us to our uh, typical board reports, which begins with Dr. Gase. So the Business Advisory uh, Council met on October 27th, uh, and we, um, we basically um, brought forth the three subcommittees, uh, Money Management, Career Activities, and Soft Skills, now to be called Success Skills. Um, and so some interesting points were brought out. Um, money management, we talked about, uh, you know, foundational sources uh, such as uh, Dave Ramsey, um, uh, some of his uh, information uh, could be used. Uh, Sharon George presented uh, uh, Getting Ahead in Poverty Simulator, uh, which we brought to, to help understand uh, students' plights. The Career Adva Activities um, Committee, uh, discussed uh, uh, the thought, the concept of having every freshman uh, have a job shadowing experience. Um, we thought that uh, probably um, uh, having a couple of different uh, job shadowing opportunities, probably based upon their uh, in, uh, interest and aptitude, would be a, a, a great idea. Um, we talked about the job fair for April 19th is uh, of 2023 is a job fair for all students. Uh, the soft skills or the success skills um, was an interesting uh, part. Uh, two of the members, uh, uh, Jana Martin and Carl Pastorella, uh, <clears throat> posited the, the, the thought that really we need teeth uh, uh, to make th something like this happen, um, and that would require uh, legislative um, work. And so um, I volunteered to <clears throat> speak with um, our uh, state representative and, and Senator Reinecke, uh, which, um, interestingly enough, led to a meeting the next day with uh, our two representatives, uh, and um, and uh, Mr. Reinecke, Senator Reinecke is uh, very passionate about um, work-based learning, and um, he's also um, found himself up against the uh, the ODE for several years, and uh, toward that toward um, improving that. Um, work-based learning component in the state of Ohio. Uh, he has a Senate Bill 178, um, which he's putting uh, uh, forth. Um, and I will be going down to, to the State House tomorrow to uh, um, give testimony on behalf of that. Um, the idea is to take um, this, the Ohio uh, Department of Education and separate out uh, a work-based learning component. So that the leader or the director of the work-based learning component would actually be appointed by the governor and not under the um, the State Board of Education uh, purview. Um, it is a little bit radical, and I think there's going to be some enemies made, but but I do believe um, if we're going to make something happen for the the, the, uh, the state uh, and, and districts across the entire state to help us with work-based learning, we're going to need to have some kind of... Um, Financing and um, and direction at the top, and I think ODE has has a history of uh, dragging their feet on that. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, the next meeting will be uh, November seventeenth at and it'll be hap uh, at National Machinery. They're gonna we're gonna have a tour uh, following the um, the board meeting that's or the oh that's right what a, yeah. December 1st, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's November 17th past. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. <laughs> the first mistake she's ever made. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gay. Uh -huh. uh, Mr. Perez, over to you for finance. We met last Tuesday and we went over the revised forecast that we have on our agenda tonight. And I believe that Ms. Perry will give a discussion at that point. I trust that everyone has read that over. And if they have any questions, she's she answered them for Tuesday and I'm sure she'll do it again today. The following three fall under myself, support services, personnel, and records. Um, support services did not meet and personnel and records also did not meet, which will bring us back to Mr. Perez for legislative. Thank you, Ms. President. Mrs. President. Um, at this point then I follow up on what Dr. Gase just mentioned. One of the bills that is out there right now is the the action to try to create a new cabinet level position that would put ODE under workforce, I believe. It was something that I is similar to what I think and looking it over it was attempted before when Kasich was governor and I don't remember the board actually taking a position at that time. I would have to say that with my esteemed colleague, I kind of take a different approach. I just want to make sure that education does get a seat there, but that this isn't a whole thing having to do with the Board of Education and the legislature, but it really is a effort to keep education at the forefront and agree with what you said, that if it means that we're getting increased funding, I'm all for favor of that. And then just following up in terms of the conference that we're at, there was discussion on the lawsuit on the funding issue and that there were requests that we discuss the issues of whether we want to, I believe, it wasn't very clear whether we would do an amicus or just side with the proponents in that case. Um, again, we haven't really discussed that, so I would just leave it to the board if they ever want to discuss that issue. And that would be on the funding and the vouchers. Thank you, Mr. Perez. That brings us next to Mr. Williams for both student achievement and policy and governance. The policy committee did not meet in November. Um, I was out sick and I think Mr. Richards was out sick the day before. So uh, we didn't have any pressing issues to discuss at that time. So we will meet not this Thursday. Um, our, our normal meeting would be the, the first Thursday of the month in this case, because it's the first of the month we'll meet on the, the second Thursday. So the eighth. Um, so we'll meet on the eighth. Um, as far as a uh, student achievement, um, at the uh, Capitol Conference, I had a chance to uh, go through the Student Achievement Fair. And there was there were some obvious themes there. I think we could all guess, right? Uh, STEAM and STEM, uh, there's a lot of career development things there and uh, community service related things. Uh, I'd say the, the biggest thing that came out of it though was um, getting to see that now. Um, we have, a, a I think, a better opportunity to be deliberate about coming up with some things that we think we might want to take to the fair as opposed to later in the year or closer to the conference trying to find things that we might be able to take right so maybe maybe some more deliberate action in the, the coming year to to get some things in the works um now that that might be good good to go um uh, other than that uh, as far as student achievement the the last newsletter there was a few career uh career development things that i sent over to dr gase and um there was a uh, an interesting article in the, the success newsletter about um, vision for for children um, in the, the last few years maybe um, some health care plans have changed or some people have lost health care uh, after having lost a job and maybe not um, maybe not all kids now have appropriate health insurance that has vision coverage to properly identify them as needing glasses um, so there was no conclusion there but maybe some some data that might be pointing to less actual vision care for kids um, maybe impacting achievement, right? I mean, it's the student achievement newsletter, right? So, um, it sort of on a, a similar theme to, uh, that, that I mentioned a few months ago, the, the loss of study skills, right. Uh, due to kids being at home through COVID, right. So there's maybe some, uh, some things that, that we can look at there going forward. That, that's interesting. You say that because, um, uh, statistically like one out of 20, uh, children will have a convergence disorder. So they, you know, it'll be the kid that's just won't spend more than maybe five minutes reading because it's, it's it basically frustrates them and hurts their eyes. So, um, and teachers oftentimes can recognize that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, maybe we could reemphasize uh, teaching our first uh, kindergarten, first, second grade uh, teachers to, if you see a child that, that is struggling, doesn't, doesn't spend the time or finds, a, you know, they get fidgety when they're trying to do that reading, it could be a convergence disorder and, and recognizing that and getting them to a proper, uh, 
assessment is important. Yeah. Just anecdotally, it was a music teacher in this district who sent an email home that said that they didn't think my daughter could, could see very well. And, yeah. and from that, realized that she definitely needed glasses. So absolutely, it's opportunity there. Thank you. Uh, this brings us to 4.02, superintendent's reports and recommendations. So on behalf of the staff leadership team and even talking to our, our, our associations today, I, I think last Monday and Tuesday went well. Uh, the overall sentiment that I got from staff members and leadership team members and the teachers association uh, was that that was time that was very, very valued. Uh, Mrs. Kuhn is going to be sending out a survey uh, to staff so we can get some better data about how it went. But the the quick anecdotal data that I received from from people and in, in talking to different individuals was that that, that was time well spent uh, and well benefited. Uh, for any high school students that are paying attention to a board meeting tonight, uh, I know they're all sitting at home watching a board meeting. Uh, we are gonna be uh, working with the high school to turn on the results of those youth science survey results. I know a lot of students were, were waiting for those. We wanted to make certain though that we could explain the results for those students prior to them getting that. So that's gonna be something we, we will work on very quickly. Um, I'm not saying that I have firsthand information from any high school students that they were upset that they didn't get those results right away, uh, but we will make certain that they get those results turned on fa fairly quickly. Um, and then once again, as I said at the beginning of the State of the District speech, uh, the plan would be hopefully, and I think we're still on track for this, but in January, to kind of have a, a tactical plan about how we can move forward as a district. Um, it may not be per se every single one of those data points, uh, but it would be putting in place uh, the processes and the staffing configuration to be able to better meet some of those goals so that we can meet uh, more effectively. So that's, uh, everybody can look forward to that in, in, in January. Uh, we'll hopefully do that as part of a presentation. Uh, but yet again, on behalf of the staff, I will say, uh, and I don't think that I will be out of place. Uh, if any member of the leadership team disagrees, I'm sure I'll get a text message here momentarily. But uh, I, I will say, I think it would be the hope uh, an intent for a lot of staff members that what we did last Monday and Tuesday, uh, it might look a d different and different topics, but I think the, the thought would be and the hope would be that maybe that's something that we could continue moving forward. Um, yet again, I'm not saying it would function the same way uh, or doing the same topics, but uh, I think that was time well spent uh, for our staff. And so we might consider trying to do that again in the future. And that's something that we'd meet about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richards. This brings one us thing, oh, um, go ahead. One thing on that, how many students needed supervision during those two days? 65. 65, okay, thank you. And yet again, that was something that we provided because we were changing the calendar with only two months notice. I'm not certain if that's something that we would perpetuate moving forward. We could look at having some other community partners that might be able to do some things um, that way. Uh, and I forgot uh, under additional items, holy cow, and they're already here and he's been waiting for an awfully long time for it. I'd like to cede some of my time uh, to talk, uh, have, have Mr. Schreiber and our track and cross country coach come up to talk about indoor track for a brief moment. And this is why I leave my cell phone out so that members of the leadership team can text me when I've forgotten something. So thank you. Thank you very much. We are proposing that indoor track at the high school level be recognized by our Board of Education of Tipsa City Schools. Findings, our high school track athletes are already competing in these events, and because indoor track is not recognized, <clears throat> excuse me, as a club sport, our athletes cannot receive postseason awards and not be invited to postseason events. We would need a, a volunteer coach, which Mr. Bob Fitro has volunteered to take on this position. He has all the necessary credentials to be our coach. Students participating would be responsible for their own transportation to and from practice and the meets, and they would also be responsible for entry fees. 
Their practices would be held primarily at the Heminger Center, Tiffin University, to receive specialized training as TU has agreed to let us have personalized workouts and practice in their facility. They also offer uh, athletes to come in on Wednesday evenings uh, to work with their kids as well. Uh, please consider us, please consider granting us permission to have high school indoor track as a club sport at Tiffin City Schools. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, Mr. Fitzroy's here if we have any questions, but, but we did look and he did a lot of research, has all the credentials that, that is necessary. And, and again, our, our kids are going to uh, compete in these events already. And, and we're just opening the door for them to be recognized when they do, when they are successful to move on and be recognized um, and represent us as our athletes at Tiffin City Schools. And I will say this would be a recommendation that I would actually support as well moving forward. Um, the district is simply lending its name and its credibility to, to what these student athletes would be performing. Uh, as, as Brad said, these are students that are competing in this anyway. Uh, but now they can go on and look for additional honors and and do that under the name of Tiffin City Schools, which I think is is fantastic as well. And, and I appreciate coaches volunteering. That's a pretty common phenomenon for the schools that do have indoor track. Um, it is typically considered a club-based sport, and it is typically done on a volunteer basis. And so I appreciate our athletic program working to to make sure we can provide those opportunities for kids. I have two follow-up questions. Um, one, what is the process for the board um, approving it as a, as a club? We'll start there. What's that process? Uh, simply making a motion to approve it as a club sport, and I'm going to look at Mrs. Perry to see if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure all is necessary is for the board. This is where she gets upset with me. Um, I, I think all that's necessary is for the board to say that we are, in fact, approving it as a club sport, that we recognize it as a club sport for Tiffin City Schools. I have several questions. Okay, go ahead. Mr. Scheiber, do you yep. know if there's an OHSAA requirement that we need to do anything or? There is not. Okay. Um, it, it is, uh, um, I would say, under the auspices of uh, the Ohio Track and Cross Country Coaches Association. So uh, they are, in fact, it's not an OHSAA uh, activity, it is separate. So that's my next question is yeah. the difference between why it wouldn't be a recognized sport, but it would be a club sport. So that is correct. Happens. Mrs. Perry, did you have another thought? No, I was just going to say, so I, I mean, I don't know what we need to do officially yeah. for it to be recognized as a club sport other than just, you know, making that, that statement and voting on it. Mm -hmm. um, first question, are there any uniform costs or do they not wear them or provide them themselves? No, that was one of the reasons uh, uh, to recognize it as a club sport as well. Uh, what we will be asking is that uh, the school allow us to use uh, the, the logo and field uniforms. Exactly. Uh, currently, the, the, the kids that do participate uh, are not allowed to wear uh, school uniforms, and they are not allowed to represent the school unless uh, the board approved coach is present at the meet that they are competing at. So we would still have to approve his contract or as a volunteer? Yeah, yes. So, and, and he you, has you meet all those requirements. Yes. Yes. Correct, yeah. correct. And then I just out of, you know, just haven't had a chance to officially congratulate you as a cross country coach for your season. Thanks. I think we've talked about it here, but it was also a pleasure seeing our AD at the girl state meet taking time off that day to also rally the troops there. But I guess we know what we, we need to do if we wanted to do this. Any interest in either girls wrestling or boys volleyball since those were approved as high school sports now? As far as I know, the uh, volleyball program, they did have some flyers hanging around the school last year, but I don't think anything was pursued as far as that goes um, for the men's volleyball. All right. What was the other? Girls uh, wrestling. Girls wrestling. Girls can compete on our wrestling team. They, they can. Um, if we get enough, they can compete either all girls events or all boys events or they can do a combination but when they get to the state tournament they have to, if they make it there I was just checking to make see if we had interest in it or no uh we had one one that talked about it but uh she's now on the team at the middle school level i believe we have three okay thank you mm -hmm. 
So then is this something that we need to be put into the next agenda or it's something that we could accept a motion for tonight? What does I believe for the for the indoor track, I believe if if the board so desired, we could uh, you could amend your own uh, agenda and and make a motion to approve it tonight. You're you're free to be able to do that. Uh, you could do that tonight or we could wait to try to do that and put that on in, in December. When do indoor track events begin? Uh, the first meets we we've developed a schedule. Uh, we will be competing beginning uh, the first week of January uh, and through mid-February. And then uh, there is a, a state meet for those who qualify, uh, and that's held the first um, weekend in March. So they'll plan to compete in those regardless of the outcome tonight? Is that my understanding? That is true. They will okay. Probably most of them will go unattached and uh, okay. compete. You know for themselves okay but if we defer for a month they're still eligible then for postseason participation and that awards is correct. okay so i just want to make sure we're not impacting students nope. if we correct. defer because i maybe want to uh for me a little bit of time to, to think through this yep. see if there's any additional questions as long as it wasn't going to impact students nope. okay, okay. Fine. Yeah. so can we put that on the agenda yep. for the december meeting we can put that on the agenda okay because if not i was going to move for it, but then we could table it till next month if you guys want to do it that way, or I just trust you guys to add it to the agenda for next month. Well, as long as we're not impacting students, I think it's yeah. okay to okay. put it on the December. Well, you'll be in charge of that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I just, as long as we're not impacting students, they're, they're still able to, to do those pieces, we can put it on the agenda for the December yep. meeting, which is actually a quick turnaround. Yep, Okay. not a problem, we can do that. Mr. Scheiber, do we have any other club sports we, when I was here before, we started with the, the girls' bowling program um, and then turned that into a regular sport. I went to a, 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 a meeting at the board office six or seven years ago and it was a club sport and then, then became a regular varsity sport. As of, as of this time, I don't believe we do. They had talked, as they said, about uh, girls' wrestling and men's volleyball, but I don't think, as far as a team goes, nothing's been... I think the that. last one was bowling that changed from club sport to that we had okay i think before. i was the ad when that became when that a sport. became the sport yeah. yes my concern i'll be very upfront with everybody my concern is the term club sports uh, i would hate to see club volleyball coming in uh during the winter i would hate to see aau basketball becoming club sport for us in the spring because i think it those both negatively would impact our high school programs. I have a, I have a real concern 15, 20 years from now where high school athletics will be because of club sports. Uh, I do understand that winter track is something that's been going on for a long time. I'm also familiar with the, the pole vault camp over in Bellevue and so forth in the winter. So it's not something that's just come on, but I am concerned about opening a door that we can't close. Any other questions? Thank you both. Thank you all for your time. This now brings us to item five, opportunity for the public to address the board. Um, each person addressing the board needs to give their name. If several people wish to speak, each person is allotted three minutes until the total time of 30 minutes is used. Any interested parties? It appears no. So then we will move along to the consent agenda. Uh, I will read the titles and then ask for a motion. So 6.01, approve the minutes of the October special and regular meetings. 6.02, approve the treasurer's reports for October. 6.03, employment. 6.04, statement of purpose budget reports for 2022-2023. 6.05 donations and grants and a thank you to those participating organizations and individuals. 6.06 .06, certificate of fiscal officer. 6.07 stipends. Would it entertain a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second. Any discussion? I would just like to be able to uh, give our sincere thanks and appreciation. Uh, you will see on here, Mr. Donaldson, uh, will be retiring um, at the end of the school year. And sadly enough, I, I know just at the last board meeting, the board and Mr. Bose presented the golden apple to Mrs. Gallardo, 
Um, and apparently she's going to leave on a high note. Uh, she won the Golden Apple Award, and she's going out on top. But uh, for both those staff members, we'd like to thank them for their service at Tiffin City Schools and what they've done for our students. Absolutely. A, a huge thank you to both of those. And to Mr. Donaldson, who was one of my um, mentor teachers during my student teaching. So uh, this brings us to action item 7.01. And we need to oh, do the vote. vote on that. We don't need to vote. It's fine. But I do have one question for the superintendent. Yeah. I saw some of the hirings, I think, for wrestling and some of the coaches there. Do you have a timeline? And I know Mr. Schreiber just left on what's going to happen with baseball. Because I saw, I think, the softball was on there already. Baseball, uh, I believe we have made an offer. Okay. Um, I'm going to look back at Mr. Bowes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any other you discussion? You answered my question. Thank you. Any other discussion? Because the vote is important. Mrs. Pick. All right. Mr. Williams. Yes. Mr. Perez. Yes. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. Now we are on action items 7.01 approve five year forecast and assumptions. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Yes. <laughs> Wait for my PowerPoint presentation to come up. All right, so this is the schedule of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balances. And this is for actual fiscal years that ended in 2020, 21, and 22. And then, so three years of actual history, and then five years of a forecast. Um, and that would be for 2023, the current year that we're in, through 2027. And this is required by ODE by the end of November. So it requires the board's approval. So. Um, on the second page, um, these are the actual revenues for the 2020 through 2022 fiscal years. Um, we have property tax, real estate, property tax from public utility. Um, we do not have an income tax, so that line is always blank. Um, we have state funding that is unrestricted, state funding that is restricted. Um, that's for different purposes, such as for economically disadvantaged students, for gifted students, for career tech, things like that. Um, state reimburse reimbursements, that category is for the um, rollbacks um, for property taxes that then that the um, property owners receive on their tax bill. Um, and then the state reimburses us for those. Um, all other revenues. Um, are for um, things for such as tuition coming into the district for students um, coming in as open enrolled and their special needs um, for students that are court placed here we get um, money for from their districts um, all other sources are things such as refunds um, those could be from workers comp rebates um, but they're usually from fuel tax refunds and because we pay the tax, but then we have to submit to the state to get reimbursement. And um, the other large one is for Medicaid reimbursements. So you can see total revenues in the past three years have ranged from $29 million in 2020 to $28 million in 2022. The third slide is the forecasted revenues in all of those categories. So from 2023, total revenues range from 28.7 million to about the same in 2027. Um, if you look at the fourth slide, um, that's a pie chart of the forecasted revenues for this particular year, 2023. You can see that the majority of our funding comes from state funding. Um, that's in the red, and that's at 49%. Um, the blue section is from local property taxes. That would be both real estate and public utility taxes. That's 44%. And 
And then the other sources that I talked about, 7% in the green, and the, um, you can't even really see that little purple slice there, rebates and refunds, that's only 0.2%. The fifth slide um, shows a graph of the total revenues from 2020 to 2027 so that you can see um, how that has been trending and how it's being forecasted. Um, talk about that spike in 2021 a little bit. That is about a $1.3 million um, spike in 2021. Part of that is from property taxes that were delayed in calendar year 2020. So instead of being collected in the first half of the calendar year, they came in in the second half. That was during the pandemic. So they ended up being recorded in our fiscal year 2021 because taxes are collected on a calendar year. That's how the county operates, but we operate on a fiscal year from July through June. So that $230,000 that was delayed caused you know, almost a $500,000 swing from 2020 to 2021. And then we also had um, a state funding increase of about 360,000. That goes back to just an increase that we got from the last biennial budget. And then we also had a $450,000 rebate from the Bureau of Workers' Compensation during the pandemic. That was a one-time rebate, so we didn't see that again. So revenues went back down in 2022. So in the three actual years, average revenues as a total were 29.3 million, um, but going forward forecasted, there were only 28.7 million. We saw that an average change in the actual three years of minus 0.2%, but that is obscured by that spike in 2021. Um, going forward, I'm not forecasting any change in revenues. On the sixth slide, um, under revenue notes. So under property taxes, I talked about the delayed collection in calendar year 2020 that was recorded in 2021. But I also always wanna point out that any kind of property tax growth is limited by law. So um, as our valuations increase, tax rates are rolled back so that the voter does not experience tax inflation. If we want additional taxes, we have to go to the voter and ask for those at um, the polls. Um, and I will note that you don't see it on the forecast because our emergency levy, um, that doesn't end until 2029. So we still have a couple more years past the forecast until um, that $1.64 million of revenue expires. So we would have to go back to the polls, um, to the voters for um, that to be renewed. It's a 10 year levy, which is the maximum amount of time that an emergency levy, um, that's the maximum term. Um, right now that is sitting at 3.9 mils to collect that $1.6 million. As far as state funding goes, those, um, so property taxes are on the first two lines of the forecast. State funding is the next two lines because we skip income tax. Um, that, there's a lot of variables here. Um, it decreased in 2022 from legislative reform to fund students where they are educated instead of where they live. So we saw a drop of about $876,000 from 21 to 22, just for that reason. Um, and that is because we have more students exiting the district than coming in through open enrollment um, or community schools. Obviously they would only go out and for scholarships at private schools. That legislative reform is being phased in over six years. So we should get um, another one sixth of that reform every year. Um, but unfortunately, the anticipated increase in 2023 um, was reduced by lower enrollment this year. So we um, have about 160 fewer students um, enrolled than we did in 2022. And remember 2022 was the first year for the reform. Increases beyond 2023 are excluded in my forecast, even though they're supposed to be phased in the reform, 
um, since we have a new biennial budget bill every two years, um, legislation could change that. So we can, it's not guaranteed, so we can't count on it. Um, if we could, it would actually add $3.2 million over the rest of the forecast, but it's not in here because it's subject to legislation. State reimbursements on line 105, um, just a small change there. The tangible personal property tax hold harmless reimbursements from the state finally ended in 2022. So tangible personal property taxes were eliminated by the state back in 2007. At that time, or before then, we were collecting $2.1 million from this tax. Um, they just slowly phased it out um, and they kept reimbursing our losses. And we were down to, in 2022, we got $13,000 um, from that reimbursement, but that is finally finished. So we went from 2.1 million in 2007, all the way down to 13,000 in 2022, and now we're at zero from that source. Um, on the next slide, the seventh one, um, other revenue, and this is usually on line 1.06, it decreased in 2021 um, when we eliminated pay to participate. It also decreased um, from lower interest and transportation reimbursements during the pandemic. So we all know that interest rates fell um, and we were not, we didn't have as many student activities, so we weren't transporting students um, for athletics and also for, we had reimbursements from Calvert too. So um, those were lower, so we don't have those reimbursements showing on that line. That's about a $156,000 difference altogether. Other revenue decreased in 2022 from the state funding reform that eliminated incoming open enrollment. As I said, the reform started to fund students where they're educated rather than where they live. So when we have students come in from open enrollment, we don't see that funding come with them. Um, at least that that transfer showing up as um, other revenue. Um, that's about a million dollars on that line. It increased in 2022, the same year, from the residential student placement reimbursements that at the Tiffin Developmental Center that were expended as purchase services in the prior year. So that's a million dollars back in on that line. On line 206, other sources, um, the one-time rebates and refunds are not guaranteed. As I said earlier, um, I usually just include the fuel taxes and the Medicaid settlements. That's about $60,000. Um, the workers' comp rebates are not guaranteed, so I don't forecast those. All right, slide eight, actual expenditures. Um, in 2020 through 2022, they ranged from $30.1 million down to 27.9. Um, the categories are employee salaries, benefits, purchase services, supplies and materials, capital outlay and equipment, and then other fees and expenditures. And other fees would usually include tax collection fees and state auditor fees. Also memberships and commercial insurance, those types of things and then operating transfers out. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in my notes. Um, the next slide nine, forecasted expenditures from 2023 through 2027, ranges from $31.3 million to the end of the forecast, rising to $35.6 million. The next slide number 10, Forecasted expenditures, the par chart, pie chart for fiscal year 2023. So our largest expenditure is in employee salaries, that's 52%, and then benefits is about 18%. So those two combined are almost, um, comes out to about 71%. Um, the services in the green is 21%, that's per purchase services. Supplies in the purple is 4%. Equipment in the aqua is 2%. Fees and other items 
is 1.8%. That's in orange. And then the transfers you can barely see in the blue is 0.5%. The next slide, number 11, total expenditures in a graph. You can see the trend, um, the average in 2020 through 2022, 29.2 .2 million, and the average going forward, 33.2 million. The average change in the first three years, minus 3.5%, but the average change going forward, 3.4%. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide in my notes. Um, the um, decreases in those first three years have a lot to do with student wellness and success funds from the state that had to be segregated um, once student or once the state funding reform um, started in 2022. Um, we no longer have to do that for anything that we received before that for wellness and success had to be segregated. So we reallocated personnel and purchase services beginning in 2020. And we received over four years, we are reallocating a total of $1.3 million. But all of those expenses will be fully reinstated in the forecast by 2024. And most of that, well, personnel and purchase services, that would be the first three lines of expenditures. Personnel would be salaries and benefits. Um, also, ESSER funds and CARES Act funding from the um, pandemic, during the pandemic, and those are federal funds, we were able to reallocate personnel and purchase services beginning in 2021. And over the four years, they total about $3.3 .3 million. That will all be fully reinstated by 2025, assuming that we sustain all of the staffing that was either reallocated or created. On line 3.03, .03, purchase services, there is an increase of $1.4 million beginning in 2021, and that's for the residential student placements at Tiffin Developmental Center. And remember, we are reimbursed as other revenue in the following year. So there's an offset there, but it's delayed by a year. We have a decrease of $3.2 million beginning in 2022, and that's the legislative reform for state funding, funding students where they are educated instead of where they live. That eliminates all of the outgoing open enrollment, community school, and scholarship transfers that we used to receive state funding as revenue, and then we would pay it out um, as a purchase service and we were always paying out more than we were receiving. So that's one thing that the funding reform really was fixing, was um, that you were sending out more money for open enrollment students than you were receiving. We have an increase of $680,000 in 2023 this current year, and that includes additional student costs for special needs and alternative placements. And Mr. Nadeau spoke about that during his presentation. So there is a variable there. And then um, when these um, basically reset my basis, so then going forward, I just assume that that will continue, that trend will continue. Supplies and materials, which appears on line 304. Um, we have an increase in 2023. It's just um, a one-time increase for um, carrying over the curriculum budget. Um, which that will continue to carry. I shouldn't say one time because it'll continue to carry over um, if it's not spent, but that's about a $500,000 increase in 2023. We have an annual budget of $350,000 per year. If it's not spent, then I just keep carrying it forward. But it will show as an increase in the um, forecast when I do that. Line 501, operating transfers. We have an increase in 2021 um, from eliminating all student fees. So the general fund has to subsidize um, the fund that is um, transacting all of the student materials that used to be fee-based. Also, we moved the House Bill 264 energy improvements bond payments um, from, uh, oh goodness, it's from a higher line. The state auditors required that we transfer that money to a bond retirement fund and then pay it out of there. So basically, 
I just moved the expense on line 405 and 406 down to line four point or down to line 501. So that's why that appears higher. Um, and I should note that um, on line 301 salaries, those in the forecast, I typically use an increase of 2% per year for the um, already approved salary schedule increments. Um, but I do not include any increases that have not been negotiated yet. On line 302 for benefits, um, there's been some variation there um, because of insurance premiums. Those, you know, at one time only increased maybe 5 to 6% per year. But in 2023, we had a 20.8% increase. And that was based on the volume of medical claims after the pandemic. So there's a spike there. Um, on slide 14, um, this represents line 601 in the forecast. So this shows um, if revenues exceed expenditures or if expenditures exceed revenues in any year. Um, when expenditures exceed revenues, that means that we are in deficit spending. So you can see that we were in 2020 at 1.1 million. And then in 2021, revenues exceeded expenditures by 645,000. In 2022, revenues were higher at 828,000. But in 2023, I am forecasting that expenditures will exceed revenues by as much as 2.6 million. In 2024, 3 million. 2025, 4.5 million. 2026, 5.6 million. And 2027, 6.8 million. And this trend is going to occur because um, we have 0% annual revenue increase. That's due to the things that I talked about, especially stagnant property taxes that are limited um, by law um, for growth and the unpredictability of state funding. And we will um, find out what state funding is going to do in hopefully in June of 2023. Hopefully. It's, I, I have experienced years that it has not met the statutory deadline of June 30th and not passed until after that, so which makes it difficult. Um, at the same time, while revenues are not increasing, annual expenditures naturally are um, going up 2.6% per year. That is from salary schedules that are already in place, health insurance premiums that are rising more than they have in the past, um, from student services and special needs, and then of just um, other inflation for, for materials and equipment and other services, utilities. Slide 15 shows the forecasted changes in fund balances. So the top line, 601, that's the um, excess of revenues or expenditures. Um, and then we have our beginning cash balance from carried over from the year before. And um, then the difference is the ending cash balance at the end of that fiscal year on June 30th. Outstanding encumbrances are outstanding purchase orders, obligations that have been placed, just not paid for yet. And that is usually around $1 million. And then on line 1001 and 1201, we have our adjusted balance after those outstanding encumbrances that we can use to certify appropriations contracts, salary schedules, and other obligations. Um, and then we can show if there was a new, um, if we're proposing a new income tax or property tax, and then we can um, show our unreserved cash balance. So you can see in 2020, it was 15.9 million, 2021, 16.1 million, 2022, 17.2 million. And then on the next slide, number 16, you can see what that looks like for um, the five years this year and the four years going forward. Um, so I already talked about the deficit spending on that top line, 601. Um, and then if you go down to 1001 and 1201, that balance for certifying appropriations, we have to have a positive balance in the current year and one year later in order to do that. So that means we cannot certify our annual appropriations in 2026 since we have the negative balance 
projected in 2027. Now I realize that a lot could change between now and then, um, but if this forecast would um, hold true, then we would not be able to certify appropriations in 2026. So that just means that something needs to change before then, um, whether um, a revenue source um, comes in higher than forecasted, um, if expenditures come in lower, if um, a levy is proposed to the voters and is successful, then that will change that picture. Um, as far as certifying contracts, salary schedules, and other obligations, we need to show a positive balance in the current year and two years. So that means we wouldn't be able to certify any of those things in 2025 uh, because we have that negative balance projected in 2027. In this forecast, we do not have any income taxes, income tax or property tax proposed, um, but obviously due to this forecast, that's something that we will need to monitor revenue, especially with state funding potentially changing in 2023 and our expenditures and um, you know continue to um, plan for that need. The next slide, number 17, shows our carryover balance in a chart. Um, and you can just see in 2020, it's up at 15.9 million and it drops down to negative 5.2 million in 2027 due to the deficit spending. And if that um, fair school funding plan, the state funding reform, if that phase in of one sixth of that increase per year, if that would continue, um, if the next biennial budget bill from the state continues that, it would add $3.1 million to the end of the forecast in 2027. That would be the cumulative increase. So we would have a negative of 2.1 million instead of a negative of 5.2 million. On the next slide, slide number 18, this shows our operating months in reserve. So we always look at um, what is our cash balance and compared to our um, monthly expenditures, how many months of cash do we still have? Um, in 2020, we had 6.5 months and goes down in 2027 to less than, um, we have negative 1.7 months. And that is, of course, due to the deficit spending that's projected. The minimum number of months usually that's recommended is three. Six months is preferred by most treasurers um, and administrators. Again, if that fair school funding plan reform phase in is continued by state legislation, then we would have negative 0 0.7 months. So we would add a month to the end of the forecast in 2027. Um, the last slide just shows um, where the forecast is available, either by calling me um, and I can provide a copy, or it will be available on our website at tiffincityschools.org, or um, it's also available at the Ohio Department of Education's website, education.ohio.gov. Yes. Um, this doesn't show the cap expenditures out of capital improvements fund, correct? Correct. That hmm. line has been eliminated from the forecast. Um, okay. So that's separate so that the public understands this doesn't include any like physical things, expenditures we make out of that fund. Correct. This, so this um, is... Yeah, and that was not actually a fund. It was just a line in the okay. general fund that was being reserved, but it was not um, resolved by the board to do that, to set it aside in a separate fund. Oh, no, I'm actually confused oh. on that. It's, I'm at okay. the permanent improvement fund. Oh, permanent improvement. Okay, that's, two different things. Right. The capital expansion, not, that, that's actually the one million we put now showed as general right. revenue instead. Correct, correct. That's, that, there's a line, uh, let's see, it was line 902 in the forecast where we were reserving money right. for that purpose out of the general fund. That's no longer there. Um, the permanent improvement fund is a separate levy. It's shown in a separate fund. It does not appear in this forecast. Right, so that the public understands that those expenditures aren't what's affecting these costs there. So. Correct. Correct. Those are separate. And then again, we do, I think, get a more accurate picture now that we moved the million out of that not reserved whatever fund right. back into general revenue. Right. And it I doesn't think, reduce the balance at the bottom. And then is it fair to say that basically 
that federal funding allowed us to move some of the employment we have. So it doesn't show as expenditures, but we're spending it with that federal money. Yes. But we'll, at some point, Mr. Richards will be responsible for deciding what to do. So the public doesn't see it on there, but we're still paying it, but it comes out of a different fund. So it doesn't come out of there. So it's not like our expenditures dropped by that much in those last two years, correct? Right, expenditures were just reallocated to a, a fund that they needed to be segregated. So. Yeah. And I think that's important to understand is that I think that that federal funding bought us some time, which is what we looked at in maybe a year to two year from where we were last year. But it really, at some point, we have to decide where we're going to go. And I think we do have to leverage and go, hey, state reps, we really would want you to implement it, but it would be this year for the next two years. And then it would require them to do it again the next two years after that, unless they decided to extend it beyond the biennial budget, correct? Which, so we're kind of at their mercy in that regard. I think one of the things that we're going to find with with funding, um, and and I can probably do a presentation. Mrs. Perry can join me on it at some point in time, talking about House Bill 920 um, that was passed, I believe, in 1976. Um, it talks about how schools are funded. Um, the reality is, in the state of Ohio, the average length of time that most districts go. Without, without having to be on the ballot for in additional operating funds is three years now. Uh, that is the state average, I believe. And it's been 10 for us. And it's been 10 for us. Um, so w one of you had asked me a question, or, or, and I, uh, I won't out anybody, but are, are we cheap or are we frugal? Um, are we a little bit of both? Uh, the reality is most districts, and I'm not saying that we have to do what everybody else does, but majority of districts are having to be on the ballot between three to five, every three to five years. We've been 10 uh, for operating. So I, I think we can make a very strong case that we have been very fiscally responsible. Um, through our presentation, I think we could make a case, not saying that I'm ready to say it yet, but you could almost make the case that we've been so fiscally responsible that it has potentially come at the detriment of our students in some cases. Um, but I think we are going to have to address uh, funding in some way, shape, and form. I agree, Mr. Perez, with what you said uh, and what Mrs. Perry said, and I thank her for all her work on the five-year forecast. But when you see some of the data points that have been presented, uh, there's very few pa places where it looks like, um, and, and I have relatives that live in Missouri, uh, that there are very few places that show that we're living high on the hog. Uh, we, are, we are pretty fiscally lean in a lot of what we do. So we are going to have to, and unless the legislature comes through and fully fund schools, and I will say I do appreciate the fair school funding uh, approach. Uh, it doesn't fix all of education's problems, but it's a significant step forward. But the key to that is that it would have to be fully funded. Um, and right now it's at, it's not even 50%, is it, Ms. Perry? It's about 30-something? This is just the second of a six year phase. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I thought we That's were around 30 something. 33%. Yeah, 33%. So uh, it'd be nice if uh, the State House came through and solved all of our problems for us. Um, I, I think hope is not a strategy though. And so we're going to have to plan, like schools have done for a long time, uh, that we're going to have to figure out locally how to address some of that. Any other questions for Mrs. Perry or Mr. Richards? Yeah, I know Ms. Perry indicated that this doesn't increase any forecasted salary increases coming up. However, it does have built-in step increases that are already built in, so. And negotiations are in the spring, correct? Uh, this is the last year of the negotiated agreement for all staff. Mrs. Perry, thank you and your team for all your work in putting this together. Um, Will you call the vote? Mr. Perez? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Mr. Kizabeth? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. This brings us to 7.02. Approve the extension of lease agreement. So moved. Thank you. Second. This is just to extend the lease for farming the land that we own to the south of, of the district. Um, I think it's prudent. Uh, we are going to be working on with T 
PDA architecture, and that'll come up here in a second, to come up with a master plan for our district. Um, we don't know what the master plan is for our district, and until we can resolve that, uh, it only is prudent to me that we continue to make a profit off of farming the farmland uh, and utilizing that as, as an investment for us. Um, and as we work with our with TDA and our community to come up with a master plan, if the decision is made that we no longer want to own that land, then that's obviously something that the board can engage in. But until that time, until we can really work with our entire community to determine what the best plan is to move forward with our facilities, uh, this just seems to be prudent to extend this. Thank you. Any other questions? Questions? Mrs. Perry? Dr. Gase? Yes. Mr. Kizabeth? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Mr. Perez? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. Uh, then that brings us to what Mr. Richards was speaking about, 7.03, adopt resolution authorizing TDA contract. In a motion. So moved. Thank you. Second. So I'm going to talk about the next three kind of all together uh, because I think it helps make some more sense for them, uh, but they are all separate items. The first one is to yet again make a motion to work on a contract with TDA, similar to what we did last month. The second one is the actual contract with TDA, um, and I'll talk about that in a second. And the third one is to talk about ELP. So really quickly to talk about each one so that we get a full flavor of where it's all going, because approving one of them without approving another one is kind of, uh, wouldn't make a lot of sense. So the first one is to be able to authorize the board to, to go into a contract with TDA. That one's pretty perfunctory. Uh, the second one is, and that, was going with the previous board motion to say that we could go up to $65,000 for pre-bond services with TDA. The second one is a contract with TDA to say that we would they would bill us on an hourly rate not to exceed $65,000. Um, and going with the kind of pay-as-we-go model, I think, is better for our district. If we move more quickly and we use less of their time, then we spend less money on architect services. If it takes us a longer period of time, we're gonna spend a little bit more. Um, so I think that it behooves us to work expediently and efficiently uh, with their services so that we aren't just dragging things out forever and ever. I think it gives us a little impetus to try to uh, be more efficient with our services. In the TDA agreement, I will note uh, and if people haven't experienced, actually, we haven't experienced this here for a long time. Whenever, when did we build the middle school again, Mr. Bose? 2003. So, um, per statute, there is no quid pro quo in architecture and with selection. So, should the district and our community support a bond issue at some point in time uh, so using TDA architecture, there is no a, a guarantee at all. Uh, that TDA would be selected as the architect for the district moving forward. What they have done is they've also included in their in their price proposal that if they were to be selected, though, uh, almost every architecture firm that's selected would also talk about pre-bond services. So what they are saying is they would credit us with any amount that we've already spent towards a future project. Um, which is fairly common. That's that's a, that's a common practice. Obviously, if we selected somebody else, we pay them the amount that we've authorized to pay them, and, and then we part ways with them, and they, we go our separate direction. Um, the final one is an ELP agreement. Uh, some of you, I think actually, just maybe the two of you haven't gone through the ELP process before. Um, so just to kind of refresh everybody, L process is an expedited, expedited local partnership program that is working with the OFCC. Uh, by approving this tonight, we are not stating that we have a plan and that we are guaranteed to be on the ballot at a certain point in time. Uh, in fact, in the ELP agreement, it says that we could be on as early as next November or as late as uh, November of 25. So there has to be an ending point for an ELP agreement. That's a new change that OFCC has done. Um, and per that ELP agreement, we would only put something to the voters in working with our community and working with the different groups that we're organizing to make sure that we have positive, positive feedback from our community um, moving forward. So I just wanted to make certain that we talked about 
what is ELP. Uh, I don't want anybody saying, well, they've approved an agreement with, with the state to do that. We don't have a plan for what that is. We are simply wanting to take advantage of the state's resources and have them help fund uh, some of those plans. For example, one of the things that the district would have to do is we'd have to do new updated enrollment projections. Um, without an ELP agreement, the district would have to do that on its own, at its own dime. By, by doing an ELP agreement, the state would help co-fund those enrollment projections. So by doing the ELP agreement now, it allows the state to bring in some resources so that we can work with the most accurate information. So I kind of wanted to just talk about all three of those. Uh, they are separate vi uh, uh, items that we have to vote on, but I think making certain that we understand how all three of them relate to one another is important. And then superintendent, I think at the conference, I was able to talk to that department and just to update everyone, we were 187 on the traditional funding plan. So that's where we were at. And I think this only allows us basically to utilize their services because we haven't as a board decided to do anything yet without going to the public, correct? Correct. And districts can, so there's two different ways uh, for school districts to do projects. There's ELP and there's CFAP. CFAP is the one that most people are familiar and comfortable with, which is, um, in our case, we have a 69-31% uh, split, 31% local, 69% state share. Um, if we, we sign for CFAP, we go to the voters, uh, they give us 18 months, and we pass it within the 18 months, we go back and we say, hey, we passed our share. Uh, state, you now need to give us your share, and they say yes because we approved you because you were CFAP. That's the way it works. ELP does not work that way. Uh, we get to, if we raise our share, it moves us up in the line, um, but we are not eligible for CFAP because per the state numbers, we are more than two years away from being eligible for CFAP. Um, and very bluntly, we're we're probably more like four or five years away from CFAP. Um, that's not an exact number. Uh, we can't calculate that. That depends on how many people pass and all these other fa factors, but that's kind of what we're looking at. Any other questions? So then... Can, can I move to approve the three of those together or... I think they all have to be separate votes, don't they? Yeah. Okay. I think they all have to be separate. I have to keep them separate. Yeah, checking. All right. So we'll vote now on 7.03. Mr. Kisabeth. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Dr. Gase. Abstain. Mr. Perez. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. 7.04. I'm not going to have you share the explanation again. Approve the TDA pre bond issue services agreement. Entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Any discussion or questions? Mrs. Perry? Mr. Perez? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Dr. Gase? Abstain. Mr. Kisabeth? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. And 7.05, adopt the ELP resolution. Entertain a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second. Any other discuss discussion or questions? Mrs. Perry? Mr. Kisabeth? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Mr. Perez? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. 7.06, approve notice of request for waiver letter. Entertain a motion. So moved. Thank you. Second. Mr. Richards? This is, a, I believe, a unit at Washington Elementary. Um, we started the year under capacity in that, in that uh, unit, uh, but it has gone over capacity because of move-ins and, and just new students. Uh, per Ohio law, we are required to provide notification if we are seeking a waiver to go above that. Uh, Mr. Nadeau and his team have worked diligently, and I believe we will still provide outstanding services, but it does go above the set ratio for this year. As part of that, we are also required to notify parents of that as well. Any questions or discussion? Mrs. Perry? Mr. Williams? Yes. Mr. Perez? Yes. Dr. Gase? Yes. Mr. Kizabeth? Yes. Dr. McBride? Yes. At this point, this brings us to board discussion. Uh, we've had a number of discussions throughout the evening, and a lot of board members have discussed um, various components of being at the OSBA conference. Um, prior to moving into executive session, are there any highlights or pieces that any board members wanted to share 
after having gone to OSBA conference? I'll just share a couple quick notes about the, uh, the amendments that were passed regarding the legislative platform. Um, so I won't go into too, too much depth here. I will send the, the summary of the notes out to the, the other board members though. Uh, there's some, just some language changes, um, things that were phrased previously as heroin and other opioids have now been just changed to just drugs or drug. So just sort of generalizing that a little bit. Um, one, uh, regarding the state, uh, state report card, right? Um, so you mentioned you're not in love with the report card, but it's at least uniform, right? Uh, so there was, uh, some some things adopted to to change some of the wording around that uh, so supporting legislation that moves toward a varied system of assessment that allows students to demonstrate academic competency and mastery in ways beyond the standards uh, sorry state standardized tests so basically uh, adjusting some of that to support legislation that is just beyond standardized testing and um uh to uh move to a system of accountability that is is a meaningful indicator of the quality of a school district a holistic representation of the efforts within the district within the district to develop the whole child. So um, you might think about like career development kinds of things, right? So just basically moving straight or strictly beyond that, that scorecard, right? So um, there's, there's some other um, less interesting notes here, but I'll, I'll send those notes out to the board. There, a lot of language change, right? To, to more generalize some things, so. Thank you for that. And thank you for attending as our delegate. Any other key takeaways from conference? Just being mindful of time as well. I do want to thank everybody for being in attendance. I'm not certain that we've had all board members in attendance, at least not in my recent history, Dr. Gase. Yeah. yeah so, uh, what? Yeah, so uh, thank everybody for attending and for um, spending their time making sure that we can be better um, in our roles. Um, at this point, I would entertain a motion to move into executive session. I'm going to get the X right tonight um, to consider employment uh, um, of a district employee. And then turn a motion. Thank you. Second. Second. Oh, go ahead. You can. <laughs> Second. Mrs. Perry. Dr. Gase. Yes. Mr. Kizabeth. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Mr. Perez. Yes. Dr. McBride. Yes. And there is no action to follow. Yeah. Um, girls start their basketball season tomorrow. So come out and support the girls basketball team in. Let's pack the house. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Perez.